Okay. It says that it is live. And of course, uh, me being in the hood, the ice cream man would be passing by. Are you um, serious? At this time of night? <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they're trying to um, make their money. So, uh, but um, yeah, I guess to get started. So, um, All right. another session. Uh, with the Madhu Mandela Institute for the Advancement of Culture and Science. Uh, just kind of a dialogue and freestyle discussion slash lecture um, dialogue in which uh, we are going to discuss further the nature of Mr. Jean-Claude Emboli's work on this Sunday. We had uh, him as a guest to discuss his book, The Origins of African Languages, in French, and some of the major points and features of the text. We weren't able to go through all of them, but just some of the major ones. And uh, we had a real good uh, discussion. And so now today's topic, kind of as a follow-up to that, is titled The Importance of African-Centered Methodology and the Vitality of the African School." So our primary focus today is on methodology in doing research and discussing the African school, the methodologies utilized in the African school of Egyptology and, and how that is reshaping the way that we approach, you know, Africana studies and in general and quote unquote Egyptology in particular. So for those who are unfamiliar, with this particular uh, channel. My name is Asarm Hotep, and we have Brother Uwajit from the, um, is it medu netter.com Yeah, medu, medu netter.com yep. Uh, real good brother, brilliant brother, teaches the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic writing script, so y'all uh, check that out. Uh, I'll make sure that I put the, his uh, link to uh, put the link to his website at the bottom of the description you know later on uh, for those who would not be viewing live but um, what was you know before we get started what was your you know uh, impression of Mr. Mboli given the nature of the dialogue that we had this past Sunday well, I definitely, um, he definitely clarified some some points, um, and it just shows that you know it's some things I didn't know that that his work is a basically a ten year um, study, and I was impressed with the way that he he wrote his work. Uh, he basically gave you a bird's eye view of the comparative method process. He it's not like a a book of conclusions. Where you know he he did the work and then he and then he just reported his conclusions, but he actually gave you insight into the processes that he took while he while he uh, went through the process itself. So in the beginning of the book, he made some assumptions, uh, a few assumptions that end up changing. You know, he allowed the data to to um, guide his his uh, conclusions and everything. So um, I thought that was very impressive of. Um, of him, and then the, the explanations of of how meticulous and how uh, detailed, specific uh, comparative linguistics has to be in order to uh, produce the most accurate information. You know, he basically kind of um, put fuel back into it because a lot of a lot of linguists, well, not a lot, but uh, some linguists uh, deal with it kind of lazy. That he was saying they just deal with um, uh, topology or, or things that look a certain way but not really get into the heart of all the features and explaining everything. You have to explain every single thing. Why these features show up, why they disappear, um, and it all lends to the genetic relate relatedness. A few assumptions that end up changing where you know, he allowed the data to, to um, guide his higher and echo and everything. So um, I thought that was very impressive. Uh, 
You hear you hear the echo? Yeah, yeah, that was that was me. Uh, I got rid. Uh, I was just trying to see if you know if it was showing live on the um, on the quote unquote consumer end <laughs> uh, instead of us out here in the hangout. So, uh, but yeah, yeah I, was, I was um the interview was was good. Uh, um, appreciate it because it was it was what around one o'clock uh, in in uh, France. Wait. Yeah, it started off at 11 o'clock his time. Okay. Um, and so we ended up going basically to 1.30 his time in France. So it was a, uh, you know, we were grateful that that late in the evening, and especially on a work night, that, you know, he uh, engaged us yeah. you know, in the United States. So he was in uh, Lyons, France. And another thing, um, his his willingness to uh, to explain you know, um, to take questions and to, and you know, he said at the end, he said, hey, if you got any more questions, email. Yeah. And um, I think that's really good. And that he's still continuing to work. So, you know, I think that um, the conscious community should get behind him, first understand his work, and then get behind it, you know, uh, critique it or whatever, but uh, get behind him. Because it's definitely ground groundbreaking work. So, well, that's a good segue into, you know, why we're here. I don't know if you can ice cream man trying to pass back. Um, hopefully we, we pass. Hey, I'm not sure if it's was, was my audio, but you're, uh, you're not clear anymore. I don't know if that's me or... or... Clear anymore? Can you hear me? <clears throat> Yeah, that might be me. Oh, that might be me. Um, what you're saying is that you can't hear me at all? I, I, I could barely hear you. Testing, testing. See, I'm still, I think that's a little green ball. So. Oh, okay. All right, well, so that I won't interrupt because on my, I hear... Um, I'm gonna leave and come right back in and see if that helps. Testing, testing, testing. Yeah, try that. So, yeah. um, anybody in the audience can hear me and um, can't hear me. You know, please type it in somewhere that you know that you you can you can either hear me okay. Hear me okay? Then I will just uh, I will try to adjust the audio to somewhere else so I can see you. So I will. I will. All right. All right. Test and test. You hear me? Oh, I can't hear. sign language. Um, I tell you what, maybe I will just shut down and, and reboot back up so I won't interrupt. I guess if you can hear me, uh, I guess keep things moving and I'll, I'll just come right back in.
Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it live, and let me see if I can hear you through the live feed. Yeah, you're not. I believe it's you. I believe it's your system. Okay, I'm 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 looking at it live, and let me see if I can hear you through the live feed. One, two, three. Testing. Play your test sound. Testing. All right, I can hear you. Testing. You can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Mm -hmm. You can hear me now. Okay. All righty. Um, yeah, I don't know what, what, what was going on there. And I really don't... Um, I really don't know how I fixed it either. So if it, if it happens again, maybe uh, pure luck. You know, um, so let me let me exit out of there and there. So um, okay, well, before the technical uh, interruption, uh, I was saying that uh, what you said last would be a good segue into the purpose of this particular discussion. And that is on the particular uh, methodology, you know, utilized in the African school, and then to, in I guess, in a more specific way, to address some of the uh, so-called challenges, you know, from uh, our fellow comrades, you know, against some of the conclusions uh, of Mboli's work. And how all of this, you know, the the online Facebook uh, debates, you know, uh, have started. And so, you know, just to give a little background, uh, Jean Claude Mboli is a linguist out of France. Uh, a many number of years ago, he wanted to see if his language, the Songo language, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's a Niger Congo language. It's not a Bantu language. Uh, if that language was itself related to the ancient Egyptian language, and so at this particular time, he had the basic assumptions that are touted a lot in the field of Egyptology, and that is there are five particular stages in the ancient Egyptian language, uh, or at least one of them being that there's uh, five particular stages of the ancient Egyptian language, that there was a single continuum from the Old Kingdom on to the time of the Ptolemies. And so that's being one assumption. And, and, and with that assumption, what you'll read in the Egyptological literature is that the Coptic language is, quote-unquote, the last stage of the ancient Egyptian language. And so what he also wanted to do, which we became a task later on, was to improve upon and validate the methodology first established by um, Dr. Theophila Wabinga in his 1993 work on the origins of African languages. Uh, uh, which has a similar title. So <laughs> what happens, hold on one second, what happens 
what ends up happening as over a number of years as he's doing this rigorous research, he come he had come to the point where he had to disassociate with certain belief systems that had crept into the Egyptological and linguistic fields. And so, you know, when you're when he was actually doing the work and doing a number of uh, of exercises himself and, and started studying the primary works of individuals who were who were compiling these language phylums, he come to discover that their methodology and some of the natural assumptions that they had were not uh, rigorously developed and that the community within these these particular fields of Egyptology and linguistics in particular, in, in as it regards linguistics, what we call the Africanist school, they just wholeheartedly accepted certain paradigms without the you know verifying them using the tools of the trade, and so as a result of that, you know, he when when he applied the the, the methodologies, you know, utilized by linguists around the world, he, he had to sever ties with, you know, some of the, uh, the theories that were developed using less rigorous methods, um, specifically that of Joseph H. Greensburg, who, utilizing the mass comparative method in linguistics, ended up uh, you know, lumping and, and creating these super large phylums without doing the necessary uh, rigorous work in terms of the comparative method to to uh, to establish these language phylums. So the 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 tradition is that you take you know one or two or three languages you compare those languages using every single paradigm that you can possibly compare and then make a decision on whether these languages are in fact related. The more languages you do like this, then you develop, you have, you have created, you know, and, and if all of, uh, in, in many of these particular areas, all of these areas are positive, then you can theorize that these languages belong to a family of languages and then as a as a way as a as a byproduct of doing that from doing that rigorous work in terms of examining every single paradigm whether we're talking about language whether we're talking about phonology whether we're talking about morphology morphosyntax you know even typological features even though that's really not what you would use to categorize or include uh, certain things, a certain family, excuse me, certain languages in particular families. So after all of this is done and, and you've established enough that you can argue that there's a family, do you name a family, you know, and then you provide all the criterion that a certain language must uh, adhere to in order to be included in that family? So Greensburg didn't do that. He just did l these mass lexical comparisons. And from that, we get Nilo-Saharan, we get Afroasiatic, we get Niger-Congo, and we get the Khoisan, you know, language, super language phylums. And so it is this that Greensburg has been catching a lot of hell over the years for this mass comparison in these language families. Whereas other uh, linguists in the Africana school basically um, just adopted it and then tried to find evidence to fit the theory. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, that's not what you do in science. You know, you, you have to be able to test the theory or to test the hypothesis, you know, for uh, a, a given, you know, set of premises, you know, to, to see if this is valid or not. And so, you know, now enters individuals like 
Shekhanta Diop, individuals like Dr. Theofala Wabinga, who, uh, and remember that Greensburg did this like way back in 1954, refining it in 1963. So, 70s, you know, the 70s come, here's Diop and uh, Obinga really attacking, you know, the, the premises of the, the way that they categorized the ancient Egyptian language uh, as separate, you know, from, from languages that we find in West uh, and Central and South Africa. And so that was one of the reasons for uh, Sheikh Antijop's 1974 work on the, uh, the parent genetic, where he is systematically going through all the paradigms comparing Wolof with the ancient Egyptian language. Mm -hmm. and showing that they have a genetic relationship. And so by having a genetic, by establishing a genetic relationship in this detailed manner, um, it automatically blows out of the, the, the water, for instance, the Afro-Asiatic hypothesis. Because you already have argued that Wolof is Niger Congo, and if Wolof is Niger Congo and way over here, how are we seeing these paradigms matching in this very systematic and rigorous way with Wolof mm -hmm. over here? And, and you're claiming that ancient Egyptian is Afro-Asiatic. So, <laughs> so that, you know, pokes a hole in, into the, the theory of Afro-Asiatic. And so fast, fast forward to 1993, you know, even earlier than that, you know, Remember, Shekhanzi Ziyap was not necessarily a PhD in linguistics, but he, he took courses and got certificates in linguistics to be able to do what he was doing to answer a more historical question. And, um, and so, Theophala Wabinga, being a, a, in many respects, a student, and Shekhanzi Dope being his mentor. I mean, him being a student of Sheikh Anjajop and Sheikh Anjajop being a mentor to him, you know, in, in a very respectful manner, uh, argued different, excuse me, I should, I, should, I should back up a little bit. He he made some critiques on Diop's work, but then later improved on Diop's work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so Diop, uh, excuse me, in 1993, uh, Theophile Wabinga, where he challenges the notion of the Afroasiatic language family. And this is where he comes up with this theory called the Negro Egyptian. And so he breaks down the African languages into four language fathers Negro Egyptian, mm -hmm. Khoisan, Berber Semitic, and. Um, no, 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 no. Um, hold on, let me let me make sure, because I think that's it. May be just three, but no, it should be. It should be four. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I got it messed up. It's uh, Negro Egyptian, Ethiosemitic, Berber, and Khoisan. And so, Ethiosemitic is its own language family outside of Negro Egyptian. And uh, Berber is, in fact, its own uh, language family unto itself. So we have those uh, four phylums. <laughs> now, um, from there, uh, he lumps Niger Congo, Nilo Saharan, and then all of the languages, save Berber and Ethio Semitic, into this one super phylum called Negro Egyptian. And so he he makes uh, his his whole work is is dedicated to demonstrating the relationship of all of these languages that are in the Negro Egyptian language phylum, you know, especially with the ancient Egyptian language. And so Negro Egyptian and ancient Egyptian are not uh, the same language. You know, the 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 super phylum is called Negro Egyptian. And the one of the sub-branch languages is what 
according to Obinga 1993, is Egyptian. And so Theophilo Wabinga was operating under the paradigm that Coptic was the last stage of ancient Egyptian and that there was those standard five phases. Mm -hmm. And so outside of creating the Negro Egyptian language phylum, Theophilo Wabinga really doesn't innovate anything beyond that. And so basically all he does is erase uh, Afro-Asiatic and it takes all the languages in Afro-Asiatic, puts it in Negro-Egyptian, but still with the exception of Afro-Asiatic, <coughs> keeps the standard language phylums in their names. So Niger-Congo, Nilo-Saharan, and then Cushitic, Chadic in terms of language. He takes out Ethiosemitic or uh, the Semitic languages in Berber, which were, by the standard uh, Greensburgian model, would be included in quote-unquote Afro-Asiatic. And so, <laughs> as a result of this, you know, one of his major critiques against any uh, uh, the, the linguists who were trying to uh, support the theory of Afro-Asiatic was that Afro-Asiatic had not been reconstructed at that point. And it was unreconstructable. And because of that, you cannot argue that Afro-Asiatic exists. Mm -hmm. And so and so he gives certain reasons you know for why you can never reconstruct an Afro-Asiatic language family. Now given that same criteria we have a problem with Obinga. Because by that same criteria at that time, uh, Niger Congo had not been reconstructed. Nilo Saharan hadn't been reconstructed. Khoisan hadn't been reconstructed. So you have three of the language phylums that fall victim to the same, you know, critique that you had, and, and, and you, meaning Dr. Theophila Wabinga, had with Afro-Asiatic. And so you know, he caught flack for this over, you know, saying a number of years um, because his critique wasn't even handed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now we fast forward to 2010, and this is where Mboli's work is, is very instrumental. Mboli, doing his own analysis, in many ways has validated the Negro Egyptian language phylum. However, his approach is different because he didn't want to make the mistakes that Theophila Wabinga made. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> one of the things that he does differently is that he doesn't assume any language is related. In other words, Jean-Claude Emboli starts from scratch. Mm -hmm. He picks languages that are in different locations across the African continent and he does his comparison because by by logic you know these far-flung languages should not be related closely in any manner you know especially given the traditional model where the languages in which he chose belong to separate language families altogether in the traditional model of Niger Congo, Nilo Saharan, uh, Afro-Asiatic, and Khoisan. And so he doesn't deal with Khoisan, he doesn't really deal with Berber too much uh, in this particular text. The, the, the six languages that he deals with is Coptic, Middle Egyptian, Zande, Hausa, Mande, Hold on one sec. I said I said Hasa correct. Sango. Sango in his in his native his native language Sango. Um, no, I said Sango already. Somali language. Okay. That's that's what, that's what I'm missing. So Mal, Somali, which is a, a so-called Afroasiatic Cushitic language. <laughs> Zande Sango, Niger Congo, Middle Egyptian Afroasiatic, Coptic Afroasiatic. And um, which one did I miss again? I, I know I missed one. 
But anyway, and so these are a different, totally lang these are total different language phylums that he's dealing with. Uh, and so he, this is what he does his comparison, and and is able in a very systematic way to demonstrate the relationship. And so he reconstructs based on these six languages. Uh, the Negro Egyptian. So unlike Obinga, who just lumps Niger Congo, Nilo Saharan, and what's left of Afroasiatic once you take out Berber and Semitic, and 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 says that you know uh, that's Negro Egyptian, he doesn't have any assumptions of relatedness, and then works straight from the data itself. And so, <clears throat> in that discovery excuse me, during that process, that's when he discovered that the Coptic language was not a continuation from Middle Egyptian, New Kingdom, you know, on to Coptic. And so, and there, and, and me actually reading his work, I provided part of the reason for that separation and then this is what starts the nature of the debate. And so uh, I, I hope I explain in a way kind of, you know, the, the, the steps and processes, you know, saying which uh, led up to this point. And we'll get into more detail uh, throughout this particular uh, discussion. But um, anything you want to say before we move on? Uh, no, no, that, that's, you summed it up pretty good. I think, I think though, um, if you can kind of make a distinction between because you mentioned the hypothesis and then you mentioned the theory and how the language phylum is in essence a a theory um, and, I, and I know that was one of the issues that came up because uh, you know that kind of kicked off the debate um, at the start is is this uh, maybe this mis uh, conception of what is a theory and what is a hypothesis or if it's useful okay well in, in a way, we're kind of jumping ahead, but I guess this, this is a good enough time to, you know, kind of really hone in on this. And so, <laughs> during the course of the debate with uh, myself and Brother Jonathan of the Amin Ra Squad and Brother uh, Netcher with the uh, the House of Netcher, is it, out in uh, Boston? Uh, Baltimore, I think he's a, uh, he has a per-unk community. Yeah, uh, I know, uh, yeah, so with the per-unk community. And so, you know, we, we had a, a ongoing, long, drawn out for several months uh, debate on this question. And, and so in the course of our discussions, it was clear that their confusion, in my opinion, was a result of them not being familiar, one, with scientific inquiry, and two, with historical comparative linguistics, in general. And because of their lack of knowledge of these particular fields and processes, they were making arguments that weren't arguments or arguments that were unsound and unlogical given the nature of science and the field of historical comparative linguistics. And so we'll get into a lot of those details, you know, a little later. Mm -hmm. But one of the 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 later with like within the past couple of weeks, uh, so-called challenges against Mboli and his work was that, you know, the assumption, and this is an assumption because they these these two individuals who were talking about had not even read Mboli's work. It's in French, so I know they they can't speak French. And they haven't, they didn't, they uh, hadn't had the book and, and read it, but they had a whole bunch to say about his work without reading this work, which is over 630 pages, and it is a very detailed scientific analysis. And so, because they didn't read the work, couldn't understand the work if they read it, they had these un, these illogical critiques against his work. And so, again, one of the, their so-called critiques was that Mboli was basing his analysis of the separation between Coptic and Middle Egyptian on the reconstruction 
of Negro Egyptian, the, the reconstructed language father. And I should take a step back a little bit to explain for those who are unfamiliar with what I'm talking about. The whole point of historical comparative linguistics is to find relationships between languages and speech communities as a means of reconstructing history of, of human communities and to also reconstruct a parent language. And so in science, when we're talking about methodology, within methodology you, you deal with what we call theories and paradigms. And in historical comparative linguistics, one of the major paradigms for this particular field is that languages that are related and separated belong or derive from a central ancestral language. And so this, and this it, to, to put it in, in, in more simpler terms, imagine you know, a community of, let's say, 20 individuals. This community of 20 individuals has children, and they grow to about 100 individuals. For some reason, the resources are getting you know, smaller here. We need more space. So the, the children of the children, which now number in the thousands, spread out. But they keep, you know, coming back home because they have relatives and things of this nature. And they still have some kind of relationship via trade or whatnot. But you know when you expand in territory, dialects begin to emerge. And when the dialects emerge, over time, over an, uh, a length of time and over generations, if these speech communities, these dialect communities, branch off far enough and are, are not connected with the home community, those dialects become mutually, mutually unintelligible, which means that these dialects do no longer are able to understand each other. And so at this point, they become different languages. And so how do linguists or how are linguists able to detect that these languages are related and derive from a parent language, a mother language, so to speak? That's where historical comparative linguistics comes in. So they examine a group of languages that they believe are related and then they go through a, a, a rigorous scientific process, which we call the, the, the comparative method, to ascertain whether these languages are in fact related. And so they compare lexicon on um, basic vocabulary. They compare phonology. They compare morphology, grammar, all of these different things to make the case that all of these languages are related. Now, we should understand that when languages and dialects uh, separate from a, a mother tongue, the mother tongue does not stay stagnant itself. It, too, is evolving. Languages evolve, like, like all things you know, in creation. They evolve to a, a, a current state. Mm -hmm. And so if a speech community remains in the same spot, that language is not going to be the same as the ancestral language, you know, a thousand, two thousand years ago. And so <laughs> what happens is, is that we, we have enough evidence that these languages are related. Is it possible then to reconstruct the parent language? And then from there, can we use this reconstruction to help verify and validate the inclusion of other languages that we had not examined at this point. And so this is what we do in historical comparative linguistics. Mm -hmm. And so um, and so getting back to you know the issues of the the fundamental debate that we were having. So now <laughs> the charge was that Mboli based his 
his analysis on that particular point of the separation of Coptic and Egyptian, Middle Egyptian, on the reconstructed form of Negro Egyptian, which is further from the case for anybody who has read even the first chapter, you know, of his book. Matter of fact, there's several points in the discussion where he ve vehemently, you know, in, uh, tells the reader, you know, saying why you don't base relatedness on reconstructions. Because reconstructions are always changing. Because the more languages you're able to examine, the better quality of your reconstruction. And so, you know, you include a couple of new languages, it may change the nature of the reconstruction. So the reconstruction is not, you know, um, it, it's not solid enough to make an argument unto itself upon relatedness. You only make relationship, you, you, you base the relationship on the living language or the evidence of the, uh, the extinct language, like in the case of ancient Egyptian or Sumerian, you know, or any other, you know, uh, language that we have evidence for through writing, but no one speaks, or at least no one claims to speak that particular language, you know, uh, in, in, in the current day, in, in, a, in a kind of a current state. And so, so that's in essence for those who are unfamiliar with the nature of the, the, the dialogue and the debate, what was, um, you know, what was going on. And so even in our uh, discussion on Sunday, he kind of hinted on that, you know, a little bit, right? you know, and so to, you know, to dispel that myth that, you know, he based you know his his argument on reconstruction. So, you know, in in the course of our debate, that you know is a what we would consider a logical fallacy because he's misconstruing the right. uh, the argument, you know, of Mr. Mboli. And so, but this is a result of one not understanding historical comparative linguistics because linguists don't do that, <laughs> and two not even reading Mboli's work. And so when you don't read and you don't have an understanding of the field, the only thing that you can do at this point is make stuff up. And so that's exactly what they did. So they just made up an argument, an invalid argument, because it wasn't an argument made by the author, you know, who um, who did the reconstruction and who, who did the analysis to, to establish what was the, the nature of the relationship you know, of, of Middle Egyptian, Coptic, and um, the, the other uh, languages he examined in within the Negro Egyptian language file. Right. So, yeah. And so, you know, go ahead. No, I said I, I clearly saw that in, in the long discussions that we had on Facebook, the uh, misconstruing of Mboli's arguments, <laughs> and it didn't stop with there. It didn't stop with with them. It was it was also by someone who would who would people who would be considered a a linguist or works with in linguistics. Um, Dr. Clyde Winter also made the same logical uh, fallacy, the same error, the straw man, the straw man logical fallacy, where he misconstrued the argument, and then he argued against that misconstrued argument. <laughs> exactly. By, by doing that, it, it appears that you've defeated the the uh, original argument when you really didn't. And what happened is, I know the brother Netcher, uh, both the brother Jonathan and the brother Netcher, used uh, Dr. Winter's uh, misconstruing mm -hmm. as you know they adopted it for their argument. So it's like a, a you know a tag team borrowing of a straw man fallacy. <laughs> yeah. Um, that that pretty much clears it up, and I, you know, and and it really came back even to the origin, even to uh, Dr. Winter. Um, he admitted that he didn't read the text. So so right there, you know, if if we're being genuine and we're trying to be scientific about it, we you know he should have reserved his opinion until he at least read the text. But it appears that he just read 60 pages that Google book allowed you to read as a sample. And then he felt, you know, 60 pages out of a 630-page scientific manual is is uh, that's a that's a big leap. So he felt that he could write about it, and and he actually spoke 
um, opposite of what Mboli says in the book, you know. <laughs> so yeah. I thought that was real interesting. But, you know, uh, hopefully we cleared that up. I thought we cleared it up on during the discussions on Facebook. Yeah. But um, it seemed like it's still lingering that 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 Mboli uh, relied on his conclusions based on the reconstruction, as you pointed out. And on the interview, he made it clear. He he went into details about because I, I had asked him about um, well you had asked him about the Coptic. And when he broke when he um, broke that down. He went into the uh, specific features of, of the vowels, uh, diphthongs, the uh, the stress on the last syllable. These are different features. He wasn't relying on on reconstructions whatsoever. So, exactly. you know, and that's consistent with what he put in the text in the book. So, now be, before we get into to all of that and, and really kind of tearing down some of those uh, so-called critiques, you know, I want to, you know, let everyone know that you know this is this is not a personal attack, you know, on my brothers, you know, brother Jonathan and uh, Netcher. You know, uh, or Brother Unk, or Dr. Clyde Winters. This is this is a, a critique of the methodology, or the lack of methodology, and the understanding of how science works as it regards the the interpretation of a work which. One, none of these individuals had read, uh, and and two, which is a a very, very sound and scientific work. It's it's, it's in it's in a number of uh, of big libraries, you know, and being studied in universities around the world. And so, you know, for for some individuals to come off of Facebook, and with knowledge of linguistics, want to try to tear down an argument. It is it, it it doesn't do anything to advance the field, and so this is one thing that we got to understand that linguistics and Africana are disciplines, and so when you're dealing with a subject matter that is a part of a discipline, when you're doing critiques, you need to <coughs> be able to use the tools of the discipline to be able to make an argument against uh, a, a, a text, you know, within a particular discipline. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with, with that said, we also got to understand the nature of the Africana school and, and, the, and how the Africana school developed in many ways. In many ways, it was, you know, uh, it, it was reactionary, but the the Africana school develops as a result of the colonial school, which we call the colonial school. And and so the colonial school is, is, is named in one sense, and some will say the Eurocentric school. And mm -hmm. so as a result of the colonial school, remember that a lot of these disciplines, whether we're talking about anthropology, whether we're talking about linguistics, whether we're talking about sociology, were all developed <laughs> as a as a means to justify European hegemony across the world. Yep. And so they utilize these disciplines to devalue non-European human communities. And so as a result, a lot of these other counter hegemonic disciplines emerge, whether we're talking about Asian studies, whether we're talking about Mexican American studies, talking about African American studies and Africana studies, in order for these the members of these communities themselves to be able to correct the misinformation that these colonial schools, you know, had already put out you know, into the world during the, these colonial periods. And so <laughs> the field of Egyptology begins in this colonial school. 
Right. And so when we talk about Champollion and, you know, the, 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 the early British schools and things of this nature, the reason why there was a serious uh, need to study and try to decipher the hieroglyphs is because they just wanted to understand the area in which they had conquered. And so we got to understand that when when uh, Champollion, uh, excuse me, Napoleon, for example, comes into Egypt, you know, he's a military leader. Right. The these <laughs> archaeologists are coming in um, with military, uh, with a military behind them, the weight of a military behind them. And so this was a part of the colonialness. And so they. They, you know, they were trying to, in essence, find Europeans in the great, you know, civilization of ancient Egypt. And so you, you start to see a lot of these artifacts being stolen out of Egypt, and now they're in museums in the Louvre, and you know, uh, in France, or the British Museum, and you know, museums in the Americas, and things of this nature. Everybody's scrambling, trying to get a hold of ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so in this, the, the, the pioneers of the colonial school were all Christian, Judaic-based uh, in their orientation. And so a lot of the interpretations of the early Egyptian civilization in the early Egyptian text were based off of this Judaic, Rom, uh, Romano, Hebraic, uh, Christian, uh, uh, Christian, you know, uh, paradigm or lens. Everything was looked at it through that lens. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> from the earliest times, as early as far as you know, Martin R. Delaney, which is you know the first real African American to really publish, and was reading the ancient Egyptian language back in like 1879, mm. you know, um, W.B. Dubois, you know, uh, discussing the relationship uh, and the blackness of the ancient Egyptians and their relationship to Central Africa, for instance, you know, even even to the point of, you know, the, uh, the, the early fraternal organizations, like even with Alpha Phi Alpha way back in 1904, I mean, 1904, between 1904 and 1906, you know, they're adopting the motifs and making the argument of the relationship of ancient Egypt and Ethiopia. You know, and that these are these are African, black African people. And so you're starting to see this colonial, uh, this, this anti-colonial uh, literature starting to emerge at this, this early time. But they weren't, for the, with the exception of Delaney, you know, wasn't really engaged in the 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 reading of the hieroglyphic text. They were they were basing their information on secondary text, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you know, we kind of fast forward to the John G. Jacksons, to the Dr. Benzes, you know, mm -hmm. the um, the John Henry Clarks, you know, people of this era, the uh, uh, George G. M. Jameses, you know, who who was that next wave of individuals who was making this argument for a black Egypt. Mm -hmm. But even they weren't really dealing with the script. It's not until Shek Anta Jok or Shek Anta Diop comes on the scene that we are really getting a, a, a real rigorous analysis, you know, based on a very multidisciplinary approach to ancient Egypt, you know, to counter this uh, uh, colonial European hegemonic uh, interpretation of ancient Egypt and its relationship to Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, to inner Africa. Because remember, they took Egypt out of Africa. It's part of the quote unquote Middle East. Really? That's part of the colonial school, you know, in, in interpretation. So, with that said, <laughs> you know, Diop starts dealing with the language which, you know, now is a, you know, starts a different school. So you had different schools of thought. And so you had the American school of Egyptology, which is your uh, 
uh, James Henry Breasted, you know, in the Oriental Institute, which, you know, saying starts off there. You have the British school. That's your, your, um, your, Butch. Butch. <laughs> you know, um, you have the Germanic school. That's your, you know, Ermin and Grandpa, Brooks, you know, and then you have the, the French school. <laughs> and, you know, all of these colonial schools were the ones doing the excavations and doing the interpretations of ancient Egyptian scripts. And so, you know, you had a few Africans before Diop, again, dealing with the script. The first, the, the, the ones in the 1800, well, there's one that's in, in Antonor Furman, who comes out of Haiti in, in the 1800s, who's dealing with the script. Who, who, who has written some uh, on the Africanness of the ancient Egyptians. Then you have Martin Delaney. You know, uh, Dr. Mario Beatty has a good uh, work on uh, Martin Delaney and his, and his early studies in ancient, um, on ancient Egypt. And so, you know, so you have that camp. Then you have the, what I call the Schoenberg camp. And so the Schoenberg, we're talking about Arthur Schoenberg and, you know, J.A. Rogers and Dr. Ben and um, John G. Jackson and John Henry, uh, if I say John Henry Clark again, I'll say it again, uh, John Henry Clark and um, George G. M. James. Mm -hmm. So you have these individuals, you know, who began the, the African-American school, you know, of African studies in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you have what they call the Dakar school. And Dakar, because that's where Sheikh Anta Giyap you know, was 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 operating from, mm -hmm. and so he begins a a school of thought, and it, and his first real student to to be able to adopt his paradigm and to expand his work was Dr. Theophila Wabinga, mm -hmm. and so from Dr. Theophila Wabinga we have Abu Bukri Abu Bukri uh, Musala, you know, individuals like that, uh, your your Raketi Ahmed's. Your, your Dr. Ricketti Amos, who's actually in the States, but who was also, you know, studying and, and dealing with Shekhan Tadia at that time, mm -hmm. you know, and, and learning from him. Um, you know, you have uh, Oscar Pafume, Omen Digi, you know, individuals like this, uh, you know, <clears throat> and so we, we would say that Mario Beatty, you know, um, you know in, in many respects comes from that school. And so from that from that school in the United States, I'll just mention, you know, uh, Dr. Mario Beatty, Dr. Raketi Amin, I mentioned her, Dr. Um, Jacob Carruthers, right, right. Dr. Milana Karenga, you know, who come out of, which we would call the American branch of the Dakar, you know, or African school, you know, of Egyptology. And so now they're publishing works looking directly at the ancient Egyptian scripts and providing their own analysis, you know, on ancient Egypt and um, its, you know, particular uh, nuances. And so continuing in that school, you know, or individuals like Dr. Mubai Binge Bololo, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Kipkowicz Sambu, Dr. Uh, he's, uh, I don't think he has a PhD, but um, brother uh, Jean-Claude Mboli, you know, uh, who we're talking about here, and, and the countless others who are part of that school, which I would consider myself a part of that Dakar Diopian school. And mm -hmm. so in, in that school we've developed, and uh, I, I should also mention um, Dr. Malefe Kiti Asante, Dr. Amo Mazama, you know, in, in, in really kind of honing in, you know, because the Dakar school kind of merged with the Afrocentric paradigm that was created by you know, uh, Dr. Malefe Kitty Asante, and by other, you know, individuals, you know, um, beyond him. And so, and so that's why when we're talking about African-centered research, especially in, uh, uh, when dealing with ancient Egypt, why, you know, this history is important, because we de we've developed a discipline. We've developed methods and procedures. And for instance, like I'm holding in my my hand right now, one of the latest texts, 
See, when you have a discipline, you have text on the discipline itself. And what are the rules of engagement for that discipline? And so this one was released. Um, let me do this correctly. I don't. It, it's backwards on my screen, but I, I don't know if it's correct on y'all's screen when y'all see it. Yeah, it's correct. Uh, Research methods in Africana studies. Uh, McDougal. McDougal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, the latest work um, from Dr. Siri McDougal on research methods in Africana studies. And so when people are doing African studies, you know, they need to be familiar with the methodology, you know, of doing research and especially research in Africana. And so, again, I, I know for a fact that these individuals who we're having these, these debates with are unfamiliar with these texts. And so, you know, beyond, beyond Africana, there's just, you know, just within the general field, you know, um, you know doing research design. You know, this is, uh, there's actually a fourth edition out now, so I have a slightly older one from a few years ago, but it is a, a new one come out. This one, John Cresswell, um, you know, research design, qualitative, uh, quantitative, and mixed methods, uh, what does that say? Approach. Approaches. Yeah. I was reading back. I was doing good for a while. Um, <laughs> you know, which, which, you know, kind of leads us in to the nature of what you were talking about earlier. And so when you're dealing with qualitative and quantitative and mixed method approaches, there's certain things that are understood about these particular research methods. And so the, you know, you got to understand when it comes to linguistics, linguistics in many respects is a mixed methods uh, approach to the study of reality, and in, in this sense of a linguistic reality, and it's mix, it's mixed methods because it it adheres to both qualitative, and it has it has qualitative aspects and quantitative aspects, and so this is where we know that the 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 charge by Brother Netcher on Emboli is really misplaced because he doesn't understand linguistics, because there's a quantitative aspect of linguistics that must be done first before you can create your theory. And so when we talk about a language phylum or a language family, that is a theory. That is a theory that has been developed after a quantitative analysis. Right. And so you have quantitative, this is, you know, where you're, you're testing hypotheses. You know, you test hypotheses in, in the quantitative analysis. And so the, the hypothesis is that, you know, um, the hypothesis, you, you start off, you, you have to start off always with two hypotheses. You know, um, you have the affirmative hypothesis that, and let's say in this case, let's say, for instance, that Wolof and ancient Egyptian are related languages. Then you have the null hypothesis, the negative, that Wolof, and ancient Egyptian is not related. And so those are the two, two hypotheses that you're trying to confirm or disconfirm at this particular point, for you know, just for the sake of argument and discussion. So now, after you've done those steps that I talked about earlier, you know, in, in terms of the, 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 the sequential paradigm uh, analysis, can you say that either Wolof and, and Middle Egyptian or Ancient Egyptian in general is related, you know, or, or related to each other. Now you add some more languages and you come to find out that all these languages are related. Now, you know, what do we call this relationship? What are we going to call this relationship? Right. So in this instance, we call this relationship Negro Egyptian. And so the relationship wasn't established by the theory, the theory is the result, you know, of the quantitative analysis. And so that's why it, it is, is really comical in a sense that they would keep reiterating this point and, and just reaffirming that they have no knowledge, you know, of the field and how this works. And so, you know, um, you know, wanted to put those, you know, things. And so when we're doing this, when we're doing Africana studies, 
and, and you know maybe you can jump in on this uh, as well. You know we we've come into a part of uh, our culture in African American culture where does this you know to use your language uh, this MF what do you call it uh, mixed martial arts uh, <laughs> WWF you know uh, rap, battle, rap battle battle debate rap battle type debates and they think that they can do this and, and make real serious critiques and moves you know in the field of Africana you know or just any in any scientific field whatsoever without having to know anything about research methods about quantitative qualitative and mixed method uh, analyses without having to know any of that that they can make an intelligent argument especially without reading the text which is like the first thing that you should know you know about doing anything especially you know there's a process in 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 research which is called the literature review so how can you do a review of the literature that you have not yourself read you right. can't do a literature review on 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 things that you have not read and so um, you know this is the, the situation that we have here and as a result of individuals who have not gone through this training, whether formally through a university or self-taught by actually purchasing and going through the exercises and books, you know, such as these, and reading about, you know, theory, you know, for instance, like, uh, what's, what's the text I'm looking for? I have so many books around here, it's, it's you know, ridiculous. But, you know, uh, for instance, like, UNESCO's, you know, general history of Africa. Why did they start off the first in the series with methodology and African prehistory? Mm -hmm. The whole text, you know, trying to uh, uh, discuss Africana is dedicated to method because we can't have any discussion <coughs> on Africa without having proper methodology. In understanding proper methodology and so you know without reading any of these types of texts are engaged in these uh, serious conversations so like you know uh, here's another one Afrocentricity and the Academy essays on theory and practice you know you have to purchase text on method you know Afrocentricity you know so we, we, we know how to properly orient and learn how to deal with primary text, um, and and let the let the let the the people speak for themselves, so to speak. Don't have books on you know linguistic anthropology, you know, or anthropo anthropological linguistics. This is another way of saying historical comparative linguistics. You know, without basic course, without basic courses, you know, on that. Without doing, you know, having works on semantics. You know, these are whole courses that that you have to take and understand before you can, you know, speak intelligently on African linguistics. You know, you need to have introductory texts on African linguistics. You know, here's one, African language is an introduction, uh, edited by Hine and Nurse. You know, you need to have these courses, for instance, you know, and I'm not trying to, you know, show off here, but I'm, I'm trying to say what, what goes into an analysis and why, you know, individuals such as myself are able to, you know, grasp what Mboli has written, you know, like um, African Voice, an introduction to the languages and linguistics of Africa. You know, these are texts that you need to have. <clears throat> you need to have text, you know, you need to have journals, you know, this is a journal of, of language contact. So when we're talking about how, how contact affects languages, which is real key to Mboli's work, you need to have, you know, um, uh, text like this. You need mm -hmm. to have text like um, Sarah Gray Thomason and Terrence Kaufman's language contact and genetic linguistics mm. you know 
when when you read text like this, and I got you know I can go on for days, you know, recommending works. You need to have, for instance, this text. You know, the rise and fall of languages. R. M. W. Dixon, where he's articulating the concept of punctuated equilibrium, something that um, Emboli you know deals with and uses as a, a as a major premise and paradigm when um, conducting you know uh, his research. You know, you need to have these, you need to have read these texts, and so you can't, you know, uh, not have a background in this, whether formal or informally, and make an intelligent critique, you know, against a, a work such as Emboli's. I'm not saying that you can't make a critique. I'm saying an intelligent one, one that is in, one that is informed by the nature of the field itself, and 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 with the knowledge and the understanding of the processes of his particular conclusions. And so we have a whole bunch of individuals in the so-called conscious community because the technology makes it easy, you know, for anybody to do a Google Hangout or, you know, any kind of live broadcast and, and make these videos a, a, about, you know, subject matters that they have no real, uh, no invested time in, mm -hmm. I should say, you know. And and we're and there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of um, there's a whole bunch of you know just bad scholarship out there. I won't go as far as Wesley Muhammad and say ghetto scholarship, but there's just a whole bunch of bad scholarship. You know, uh, it's not even really scholarship when you think about it. It's just 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 bad arguments. You know, bad conversations. You know, in you know in in, in the public domain. It, it, it kind of fits with with a lot of things that's going on just in society. Every everything is kind of microwave, where where yeah. you know, time time is not invested into the craft, and you're not seasoned. You don't become mature. You don't become proficient at something in order to then then speak on it. Because I I noticed that even with the argument, even after what you just said uh, is said, there are people who believe that hey, I don't have to read all of that stuff. <laughs> Because yeah. you know, if if you tell me um, X, Y, and Z, I don't have to read the whole thing. I already know X, Y, and Z is just not true. So, but you know, that's just totally unscientific. That's not how, how it works. And I, I always make the analogy to music because you can see it in the music yeah. industry, where um, a lot of a lot of people that's out even today that are that are so-called famous, the um. Mm -hmm. The quality of music went down. The quality of the content, the quality of the production, it went down to the point where the upcoming generations—that's all that they're going to know. That's all that they're going to know. So to them, that's going to be like par excellence. To where the older generations, you know, and this is an ongoing thing. My, my, my parents, my grandparents, my grandparents, listening to the music and say, "Oh, that's that's garbage. That's not real music. This is real music." Put on something. And now I find myself doing the exact same thing with my daughters. The exact same thing. <laughs> so, you know, that, you know and, I, and I know I told you before <laughs> in that joke, I'm like, we are doomed. If we, if we allow this to continue, everything is diminishing. Everything is becoming microwave. Everything is becoming radioactive. You know, it's like a cancer within our conscious community because everything is sped up. Everything is everything has in haste. Uh, you know, to either make a hustle out of it, to um, gain popularity, or you know, just to have something to say. When we can count our energy, you know, probably more uh, constructively elsewhere. So, you know, I think that th these kinds of uh, discussions are important, and that's not to be down on people, because some people's ego will get offended. I, I kind of saw that a little bit in the uh, Facebook discussion. You know, uh, where it didn't, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. It's this, this is, this is scientific. You know, we're all adults. You know, we can critique and just deal with people's logic. You know, the the inner logic of a person's argument is what's important. And if it's if it's false, we got to tweak it and correct it before we can continue on. So, you know, that's not to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, hold on. Um, with that said, you know, what you, what you were basically talking about, and, and I guess we can, you know, kind of uh, refine our discussion here, is, 
basically what you're what you're saying is that you know we have an obligation to the next generation and the generations to come yep. to to give them the best quality information given the nature of the times that we're in and the available evidence because they are going to be using this information to to construct their lives with and so we don't want to give them something that is built on on a a, a, a shaky foundation and so that's why we have these methods and standards so that the quality of the information that we give is the best that we can possibly bring and so you know for those who are listening live there's you know we're trying to enhance the your one's intelligence and we want there's 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 three domains of intelligence that that you know we seek to strengthen you know, in the field of Africana. And that is one's intellectual, and, and these are the things that you have to have in order to be a good uh, scientist of the humanities. And that is you have to have intellectual uh, humility, you have to have intellectual courage, and you have to have intellectual integrity. I'm going to say it again. You have to have intellectual humility, intellectual courage, and intellectual uh, integrity. Because without it, you invalidate any and everything that you say or you try to present to the public. And if you are claiming that you are part of a discipline, part of a field, then you help to invalidate the nature of the field in which you're in. So part of being intellectually humble is recognizing when one does not have the requisite skills to intelligently comment on a particular subject matter. That is what, what, what humility does. And so being humble and recognizing that one does not have the necessary skills to make you know, uh, certain arguments in certain capacities, one would, you know, either just simply recognize it and let others who do, you know, have those type of discussions, or one will humble themselves and go through the process of learning so that they can contribute and, and make more informed and intelligent or have more uh, informed and intelligent conversations on the subject matter. Two, intellectual courage. Intellectual courage deals with the ability to be able to go against the status quo based on the strength of the evidence of one's own research. Mm -hmm. To be able to say that, you know what, this has been the general conviction for so long, but given this, you know, uh, uh, evidence, I have to go in a different direction. And so you have to be courageous in a sense, in a way, to be able to, to be an effective researcher, to be an effective teacher, you know, to be able to, you know, uh, regardless to, you know, uh, what the, the mood of the, the people and, and, and the, 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 the psychological you know, uh, level at which the people are at to be able to stand on your convictions based on the evidence. And that's what uh, yeah. MLA represents. Exactly. And, um, and lastly, with intellectual integrity, this also means being truthful. You know, that everything that you do is sound. You know, integrity is that which keeps something solid, which, which gives it robustness. You know, and so you, we we develop robustness, we develop integrity by having sound, by adhering to sound methodology. And so with that said, and this is for all of those who think that, you know, because you are, you know, asking for rigor, 
dealing with methodology, you know, that somehow you're dealing with the white man's, you know, school of thought, as if this started with white men. And so I want to read, uh, uh, I'm citing it again, this is how Brother uh, McDougall starts off the book in, in terms of speaking to posterity. He cites actually an excerpt from um, the, the sage Patahotep uh, from ancient Egypt. And this maxim, you know, uh, I'm just going to read, uh, I'm going to read it. Matter of fact, let me see if I can, so y'all can read along with me. Um, let me share my screen real quick. You see my screen? Uh, yes, I can. It says uh, Patel Hotel. Right. Okay, let me um, squeeze down a little more. Um, please excuse my thing acting slow. Um, dang, what's up with this? Oh, come on now. Is it's showing up choppy on your screen? Uh, actually, right there is good. I can we, I can read it. Um, it seems like you're still scrolling though. Darn it! Um, oh hell! There you go, right there. Okay, um, it's still kind of choppy. I don't know. This probably got too many things open. But um, this is the excerpt from Patal Tep. He says, "If you listen to my sayings." Of, of your affairs will go, all of your affairs will go forward. Their value resides in their truth. The memory of these sayings goes in the minds of the men and women because of the worth of their precepts. If every word is carried out on, they will not perish in this land. If evidence is given for the good, the great will speak accordingly. This is a matter of teaching a person to speak to posterity. That means the future. He or she who hears it becomes a master hearer. It is good to speak to posterity. Posterity will listen. And so McDougall goes on to, to state that Patahotep's proclamation charges one to produce endearing knowledge. Like Patahotep's wise instructions, the sacred duty of the sesh was to speak to posterity or future generations. This goal was to be accomplished by producing writing in deep thought that was in accord with my eye. These sacred writings would endure generations because of their truth and high standards. Was I clear? Yeah. Um, am I coming back? Okay. And so I wanted to reiterate that Pataho Teps talks about speaking to posterity. And and <clears throat> the underlying essence of what he just said, enduring knowledge, stuff that endures is robust, that has integrity to it. And so so what he's dealing with is high quality, high you know, works of high standards. And so to show that this isn't an isolated incident, well, we know, for instance, what the title of the math the Rhine mathematical project. I'm opening up in Binga's work right now, at page 421. Um, well, let me go to 422. So this is Obinga's work, African philosophy, uh, the Quranic period. And this was, uh, what, 2004 this is released. And so the, the title of the text, uh, the ancient Egyptian text, which is now known as the Rhine Mathematical Papyrus, uh, you can see it on page 422, is Tepeset uh, in, you know, Hyatt, Mket, Riket, Netet, Nibet, Sinket, Nibet, and I'm using Egyptology speak, Shetat, Nibet, Iu, Eset, Giret, Sepeherin, Tu, Shefedu, Pin. And that is the right method of investigating nature 
to know all that exists, all mysteries and all secret things. For the purpose, for that purpose, this papyrus roll was copied. And so, mm -hmm. you have back in the day, back in uh, ancient Egyptian times, that they're dealing with the correct method. The word for correct method in ancient Egyptian is tep -haseb. So yes. even back then, the Africans, in order to have that enduring knowledge that speaks to posterity, they made sure that in order to have correct knowledge, that you dealt with the correct methods, which is tep -haseb. And so mm -hmm. this stress on methodology is only, you know, keeping in tradition of, of Africana, uh, excuse me, of, of ancient Egyptian uh, studies and, and research for themselves. So in Africana studies, you know, this is what we adhere to, the correct method. And that's why we have text or research methods. This is why he started off with speaking to posterity and having high quality, you know, information. The only way, the, the, the way that you guarantee that the that the, the generations that um, come after you have high quality information is if you adhere to methodology. And so, you know, you need to, uh, they, uh, the, the, the people out there listening need to understand that you just can't go with your first mind, you know, when you're doing research. That, that plays well in spiritual circles, that, you know, you trust your gut and just go with your first mind. But, you know, your, your mind is, is shaped by your beliefs and the society that you live in that you live in and so in order for you to get to the truth you have to have something outside of simply just your mind to be able to uh, to ascertain what is true or what is not true mm -hmm. and so uh, epistemology deals with truth and how do you know what is true you know knowledge and how do you know what is uh, uh, valuable or not and you know what is valuable or not you know what is high quality or not based on you know the the tep haseb, the correct methodology, and so in the linguistics we have a methodology, you know, uh, dealing with the um, the comparative method, and so that's what Mboli uses in his text, the, the the rigorous comparative method, and not only that, he was able to improve upon the method, and to to add other aspects to the comparative method, to strengthen. The, the nature of the relationships between African languages. And one of those is the phenomena of semantics. And semantics, not, not to be confused with semantics, semantics is simply dealing with the meaning of a word or the, or the meaning of a sentence or paragraph. Mm -hmm. Semantics deals with the relationship between lexemes and concepts as it regards, here's a good semantics relationship. In the African languages, there is a semantics relationship between light and ancestors. Now, linguistically, they are separate words. But back in the day, because remember the Africans didn't have um, historical comparative linguistics, homonymy plays a major role in the, the religious and philosophical conceptualizations of indigenous African people. And so in all of these related languages, there was this relationship between light or stars or the sun and ancestors, because the same word for light is pronounced in the same way that the, the word for ancestors is pronounced. And so we know this in ancient Egyptian as a so-called Aku. Mm -hmm. So you have Aku, you know, Aku, Aku stars. You know, Aku light, Ak light. Mm -hmm. And then you have Aku, the so-called, you know, transfigured deities, was really just simply the ancestors, those who have departed. And so you find in the, um, the ancient Egyptian literature that they created a whole... Um, philosophical system and ontological system based around the relationship between these two words, which which the only relationship that they have is that they're homonyms. But you know, according to ancient Egyptian legend, when you die, and you are one who is who has been um, veered uh, has been venerated and becomes Ma'akru, you become a quote unquote star, which is pronounced Aku or Aku Aku or Ak. 
mm-hmm. you know, but that's based on the language. And so we can go into Central Africa with languages related to the ancient Egyptian and find the same semantics with a different word. This, but there'll be the it'll be the same situation. You have two words, one for the deceased and ancestors, and one for light, star, fire, that 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 are pronounced the same. And because of that, that that particular relationship happens. And so you don't find that, for instance, in the Semitic languages. They don't have that semantics. And mm-hmm. so this is one of the criteria which you know he he uses. You know, when establishing, you know, the relationships, because if you're seeing the same semantics in these related fields, this makes it stronger, because mm-hmm. every aspect of the language can be borrowed, and so linguistics always tries to historical comparative linguistics always tries to eliminate borrowings from the language. You know, and so this is that deep, you know, substrate, sub, you know, deep cultural unity that Diop was talking about. You know, how do what's your explanatory model for these deep, you know, underlying similarities in psychology and thought patterns between these communities that also share the same lexemes and grammatical structure mm-hmm. with ancient Egyptian? You know, and so you know, it's it's certain things like this that he was able to improve upon the 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 historical comparative method, and so. You know, I want to take up, you know, you know, all the dialogue, you know, you can jump in. Hey, uh, <laughs> you fill it in everything. That's, that's about all it would be. <laughs> um, I just noticed that um, in Theophile Binga's um, African philosophy, the Tep Hesib um, deals with rec or uh, knowledge. And that's the actual uh-huh. same, the same word that developed today in Arabic or in Semitic or computers, computers account. And it deals with the rigorous, and the rigorous systematic observation of, of the correct methodology to actually apply a method and to, to come back with results. And that results, those results you can say, at that point you can say, you no. Know, that's what leads to knowledge as it is explained on that point. After this, after this. Yeah. All right. Um, let me see. I wanted to. So I don't know if it's going to act up again, but uh, kind of go on. I guess at this point, you know, before we we get on those specific examples, uh, deal with you know certain logical fallacies, you know, or or uh, roadblocks. You know, to reasoning. You know, mm-hmm. what it what is that, and and how is that important to this this discussion and these debates that we've been having? Okay, well, let's see, pull up something here. Now my computer wants to act up. <laughs> They usually blame this on Merck. They, they blame it on what? Say people usually uh, blame this on Mercury retrograde. You know all the electronics, everything going crazy. Uh, it's not. Well, I mean, I, we we could just discuss it. I, um, the roadblocks. You know, logical fallacies is definitely a, um, a roadblock, and even in the uh, discussions that we've had on Facebook and in the uh-huh. conscious community, in, conscious community in general, there's a lot of uh, logical fallacies that are um, abundant, and it's a roadblock because it, it causes a lot of energy to be put into uh, places and arguments that really are non-existent and really shouldn't happen. And we could conserve that energy and actually build community, because a lot of people talk about you know community building, nation building, uh-huh. uh, unifying, economic development. But here we are, we caught up into uh, debates, but it makes it seem like we're debating ideologies. But sometimes, a lot of times, more people agree more, more than they really realize uh, that they agree. And it's because they're using these logical fallacies that they can't see it. 
So, for example, the most famous um, logical fallacy is the straw man. A lot of people know about that. The straw man fallacy where an argument is construed by a person. Person A will make an argument. Person B will misconstrue that argument. And then person B will argue against his own mis con mis uh, conception of the argument. And it gives the appearance of superiority and winning the argument itself. When all along the argument was never really addressed. So now person A is forced to correct person B, and then that correction becomes a new argument. So you <laughs> have a lot of time um, that's wasted there. So that's a roadblock. So we need to learn how to um, avoid that logical fallacy. Then there's another another um, famous one, uh, red herring, which is to basically it's a diversionary uh, fallacy. It's a diversionary um, tactic. And it's actually a tactic. Because what happens is when you, when you're arguing, and you, you realize your argument is weak, what people tend to do is that they'll deflect and they'll start talking about something that's irrelevant to the issues or the argument at hand, and then that will become that will dominate the discussion, and then that wastes time, and then the person person A will start arguing that that's what the person is doing. Like, why are you diverting? And then that becomes the argument again. And then it's a, it's a cycle. That starts a whole new loop. Uh, in computer programming, we call it, uh, what, the, the to-do loop, <laughs> the endless to-do loop. And um, so that, that's, a, that's another one. And, and you know, even in the, in the arguments and discussions that we've had about this particular issue about Coptic or the Bantu languages being closer to Middle Egyptian than Coptic, these are some of the logical uh, fallacies that have taken place. And then you have another one a lot of people use is um, appealing to authority, um, mm -hmm. which is basically finding a so-called expert to, to back your position out of context. So just because the expert agrees with whatever you said, then the assumption is that you are winning your argument. Your argument is true, and that's you know basically appealing to to um, to authority when you know again you're you're not arguing the issues at hand, and and the expert is not dealing directly with the uh, the issues themselves. So you know we we see a lot of that where people will quote people will quote, quote uh, authors that will quote who people look up to as experts or um, you know. Uh, doctors in the field. So that's a, that's another one. And uh, there's a couple more, but those are the three that are most used. I don't know, you know, I'm sure you know. Yeah, um, there's there's one in particular that I want to deal with right now and in terms of a robot to uh, sound reasoning. And that is inaccurate observations. And inaccurate observations and then I'm reading from from this particular text here, uh, page 13. In research occur when you simply misrecord the facts or data. Inevitably, you will face a situation where you will have been on the phone. Um, no, no, he's just giving an example there, but that's that's pretty much it. That you you misrecord the facts or data. And so we we invoke Dr. Clyde Winton earlier. Now, this is an individual who I've known since 2004. So basically, uh, this has been a decade. And so I've, I've been able to see over the years, you know, many arguments and debates that he's been in and to actually read a good number of his works. So I'm very, very familiar with his works, what the nature of his arguments are, his habits are. And one of his habits in which I had to, you know, point to him on several occasions, is that he has this habit of misconstruing people's arguments because he's he argues something that somebody has not said. And so that would be what we would call inaccurate observation. And so <coughs> I'm going to uh, share my screen. I'm just going to share the entire screen. Do you see anything? 
I don't see it yet. There we go. I see your entire screen. Okay. So now I'm going to go. See, this, this conversation in many respects started in, in part on the, you know, kind of famous EgyptSearch.com message form. And I don't know how, because I can't see it myself, the quality of you there? Yeah, I can read it. Okay. Um, so this particular thread on this message board is titled, because we're sitting here discussing Dr. Theofalo Wabinga's language reconstructions. And so it's Theophilo Wabinga's, Theophilo Wabinga's Negro Egyptian Linguistic File. So I'm on page three of EgyptSearch.com for that particular uh, discussion. So, you know, we're in, we're, we're in heated discussion, and Dr. Clyde Winter, who likes to spam a lot, uh, this is his screen name right here, uh, is involved in this conversation. And so, you know, all throughout this conversation, and you've read this conversation, you will see that he continually, with, without fail, misread, and then make arguments over his misreading, uh, you know, arguments that no one has made. <laughs> and so, for instance, when replying back to me on a particular thread, hold on, this is this is me talking about in. Uh, he invokes, in, uh, this brother here, Amin Ra, the ultimate, invokes in Boley's work. And then I come in saying, I actually have this book, and it is excellent. Here is in Boley's reconstruction and new language model. So I take a screenshot of the text, and this is, you know, in Boley's, you know, uh, work. That's a, um, a screenshot of his screen. And so, you know, uh, this brother here, <laughs> now we can see clearly here. This is a moonrise thing, and I don't know if I need to zoom in or not. I'll, I'll try to zoom in to make sure that people can see this. Um, um see if it's and I think I just made it smaller. Uh, it's actually okay. It's actually it's small. I know. Uh, let me go back. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that people can see this. So I can, so I can show. Okay. So uh, this brother Amun Amun Ra or Amun Ra has been discussing uh, the nature of the ancient Egypt. Uh, excuse me, the ancient African. Language families originating in East Africa. And so he's citing a text here. Amun Ra, the ultimate, is saying, Here's an excerpt from Eric, which is Christopher Eric, <laughs> uh, placing the origin of all modern African language families somewhere in Eastern Africa. And so he cites, he, he gives an actual screenshot of. Uh, Christopher Eret's work, and he gives the citation, you know, where this is found, where Christopher Eret is arguing that the language families originate somewhere in Eastern Africa. So that's my post. And then here comes Dr. Clyde Winters. This is Clyde Winters. He responds, all African languages did not originate in East Africa. These quotes do not support the view that they originated in Eastern Africa. The Sudan and Egypt to the part of North Africa, not East Africa. Also, I do not accept the view that there was a pre-proto language. Yes, we can reconstruct a proto language, but there is no way to confirm that a proto language was ever spoken by a population. So we can we can see where you know later on in our discussion where Jonathan. And Netcher is getting that logic from it's from Dr. Clyde Winters, which is you know full of full of BS anyway. And so you know I respond. I don't think there was a claim made that all African languages originate in East Africa. We are talking about phylums, not individual languages. 
And so it is out of Ra the ultimate, the following Eric that claims that all African languages originated in East Africa. This is uh, you see this? This is Clyde Winter. This is his statement. Is, you know, it is he's he's blaming this on the moon and he's blaming it on Christopher Eric. Now keep in mind that Christopher he's citing Christopher Eric and he posts the post for Christopher Eric. Um, which is clear that that is not the case because he doesn't make that argument. Uh, Amun makes the argument that the language families of phylums originated in East Africa, and then the, the individual languages spread out from there. So they don't make the, the claim that all African languages derive from East Africa. Right. And so <laughs> this is a clear case with... Uh, with Dr. Clyde Winters, and we can go on all and on throughout the um, the actual, you know, uh, discussion that we would have. Well, the the statements in the text, so that was you know a roadblock. It's an inaccurate observation. And so like he like he goes on and continues to make these arguments on his own misreading of what was actually said and what the implications are. And so <laughs> we find this particular logic, this particular practice going on continually, continually throughout this uh, particular discussion. And I'll be able to show some other examples of that, you know, um, going in, in, you know, further. Into, but, um, but you have anything to say? Uh, I was I was trying to pull up. No, I I, I read that um, I read that this you know, and I immediately saw the logical fallacies um, of Dr. Winters, where he he misquoted you. He actually he actually argued he actually argued something that you argued, like you you said A B C, and then he said no. It's a, B, C. That's the essence of what he did. And I'm trying to pull it up. Um, it's it's from the same it's from the same discussion that you just showed, but I, I had I had saved it and, and my computer's acting up right now. Um, huh. I got all this stuff open. But yeah, I mean that's that's the essence of what of what's going on. So that's you know that's that's a continuation of the roadblock. And see, and when you do that in, in these kind of environments where where debating is you know. The end thing, which is good, you know, debating, debating advances the field of knowledge if, if done correctly. So it, it's a good thing, but it's a good thing if you create a uh, a, uh, a battle type of type of while debating. Then when you hit these roadblocks, these roadblocks can take it off offline. So it, it took up a lot of time. Like you just showed, it took off eight of that discussion, and about six of those pages. Were don't need to happen. They're useless. Yeah. You know. So if you look at that on a large scale, so called black conscious community, a lot of time that we're doing debating, and you know this is why some people say you know debating is not good. Why we got to debate? Let's just kumbaya, hold hands, and unify. Debating is necessary. Debating is necessary. Yeah. You know to uh, vet information, learn fact from fiction. <laughs> With their arguments and stand on your arguments or give way to some more superior methodology. But it's the waste of time that these debates produce that causes the frustration, you know, why y'all debate on and whatnot. So I think these roadblocks, we have to eliminate these roadblocks. And I keep saying, if we keep, <laughs> keep these roadblocks going, like I'm doomed. <laughs> We are doing where it's going. Now, you know, to 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 focus on Emboli's work, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna reshare the screen again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, okay. So let me know when you you can see the screen. Okay. Uh, let me get back to that. All right. Yeah. The um the chart. This well, let me make sure. That. <clears throat> okay. I don't know why it's flickering back and forth. Okay, that's that's because I had to make sure that it was on my um 
it was on my screen. So can you see the screen now? Yeah, I can see it, but I'm saying it's going black. It's it's uh, flickering in and out. It's going completely black, and then I can see it. It's like um, flickering. Okay, let me stop sharing. Okay, whatever let you me just try did. again. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Now I'm saying whatever you just uh, did, I can fix it. Okay, we're gonna go back to that. So let me know if it's it's still flickering. I I still your camera's still on you. It's still on me. Yep. Mm. I'm, oh, my bad. I, I forgot to click share. <laughs> Is it up? Yeah, it's still flickering. Um. Crap. Everybody else is seeing. Well, my screen is flickering back and forth. Okay, I'm going to try this one more time. I'm going to share an entire screen. Share. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, so again, we, we discussed uh, Jean Claude and Boli's work and his and his, his method and what he was able to do, you know, given his analysis. So, um, <laughs> check on to Diop. Excuse me, uh, Jean Claude and Boli has redesigned the flow of the Negro Egyptian language. Uh, father. And so, uh, or family, family of father. And, and so this is from one of his pages. This is a tree, you know, of Egyptian post classics. We'll get to another rendition of the, the, the chart a little later. But, um, so as the audience can see, the, from here, Jean Claude and Boli separates, he, because of the way that the accentuation on the syllables behave in the, in the languages in which he was examining, he came to the conclusion that Negro Egyptian, uh, you have a, a classic period and then you have a post-classic period. So the languages of the classic period had merged together. Not necessarily that they you know, became one Creole language, but they had they were living amongst each other, and they were doing trade. They were marrying amongst each other. They lived in the same, you know, general geological area, and as a result of their interactions, you know, it the the languages became more and more alike. Uh, as a result, and this is something that is is really taking off in linguistics in terms of language contact phenomena, which is why I showed you one of those journals from earlier. And so, you know, it, it develops this this entity which we call Negro Egyptian Post Classic, and in Negro Egyptian Post Classic, two dialects emerged. And um, two branches of this of, the, of this particular uh, aspect of Negro Egyptian, and so he named him Bere branch, which is what you see on the left hand side, and then Beher branch, which is what you see on the right hand side. And so the 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 nature of these branches is again it's based on the accentuation of the syllabuses, the uh, words to be pronounced and how they're changed. So this word better and behead are words for liver and uh, the, the word behead is from Somali and the word better I think is from Zande. <laughs> they're all words for liver or inside. 
Is these are actually the words which become the spirit or the so-called Ba in ancient Egypt um, as, as one of its homonyms. But we, uh, we can have that discussion at another time. But we can see that the better branch is uh, syllabic in a sense. That when we say better, it has its two syllables and it ends in a vowel. The way that the beher branches is is conducted by way of the nature of the accent of the syllables, it forces the popping of the uh, final vowel and the switching to where it is um, the the central vowel is lengthened, and so that's why we say beher. And so, like you can see within those boxes, you know, you have this one syllable aka and ata, whereas those vowels are switched over in the Beher branch is, you would say ak or at. It's actually lengthened. And so based upon this, we're able to see uh, which languages, you know, uh, fall under those different uh, well, ways of pronunciation and in terms of the formation of their words. And so on this left branch, we also have two branches of that, and that is, and that's where we see Middle Egyptian, Hausa, Zande, and Mande. In this other branch of the Bede branch, we have Gabaya, and we have pre-Proto-Bantu, Proto-Bantu, Bantu languages. And so, in this other branch, we have Mir, Wolof, Coptic, Sango, Somali, Zerma, and Banda. And so when, when uh, Mboli separated ancient, the Middle Egyptian from the Coptic, it wasn't based on something arbitrary. There, there was a whole, there's, there's, there's basically a whole chapter dedicated to this and demonstrating, you know, the, the, the nature of these different branches and how we can tell uh, what belongs to what. And by looking at the Coptic language, he was able to um, um, uh, discern that Coptic and Middle Egyptian were totally separate languages. And so, uh, and so this is what caused the nature of the lot of the debate because they're still in the mindset that Middle Egyptian and Coptic um, are are, are continuations of each other instead of distinct synchronies. And so <laughs> to demonstrate in the Facebook, we have a Facebook group that's called the Meta Nature Language Facebook group. And this is where we study and, and converse about the ancient Egyptian languages. And so in this particular text, in, I mean, in, in this particular discussion, I, on August 28th, you can see me highlighting this here. August 28th, the beginning of our discussion, I'm laying all of this out. <laughs> so now, to read what I'm going to highlight here, I say the purpose of this post is to demonstrate the validity of the African school of Egyptology. As noted earlier, Coptic is a different language than Middle Egyptian. One way that we can demonstrate this is by the way the respective languages handles its syllables. As Mboli 2010 has demonstrated, the Negro Egyptian language phylum. Hold on, I think I'm getting I'm getting feedback. Can you mute your mic? Okay, that's good. Um, <laughs> as in, uh, as Mboli has demonstrated, Negro Egyptian language phylum consists of two primary branches, what Mboli calls Bere and Be'er branches, what we talked about earlier. I said that these two words are words for liver, as I discussed earlier, and we can see the behavior, you know, um, here. So this is his reconstruction at the top, and then this is the word for liver in these languages. And so um, <laughs> I'm just going to read the second, you know, same paragraph here. The reconstruction of this word, this Proto-Negro Egyptian, is fara, or bara for liver, to which we must include an I suffix to explain the shift of the open vowel, a, 
and the and most of the final vowel e in the terms above. Therefore, bara, bari, bare, bere. Uh, by regressive vowel assimilation of the middle uh, vowel passes e, given the zande form of bere. By contrast, the Somali evolution seems to rest on the fact that only the first syllable is accentuated. Bare, bari, baer, which gives us ber, Coptic be from beer, and be in shango, be, are also derived from this evolutionary process. So you can see here that you know um, and that this is based on a linguistic analysis. So in order for you to understand why Coptic is separate from Middle Egyptian, you would have to understand the nature of how accentuation affects the pronunciation of uh, different words and how that affects the vowel placement and thus the pronunciation of the word. So to continue on, given what we see above, the Zande language is emblematic of the Bere branch and the Somali language <coughs> that of the beard branch. Shango actually belongs to the beard branch as well. The nature of where the stress and or accentuation is placed on the first or second syllable as well as the position of the determinatives can tell you a lot about a language and how to classify it. So below I, I start to give some examples. These aren't the examples given in his text. This is me reaffirming what he says in his text. We won't go too deep here, but notice how the syllables are in the words bere and bir, respectively. Keep this in mind as we look at the following vocabulary examples. These are my examples. Again, this isn't his work. So for anybody who is familiar with me, they know that I always am using the Chiluba Batu language in trying to understand ancient Egyptian. So I'm using what he's saying and seeing if this applies, if we can tell the difference, you know, between Coptic, Chiluba, and Middle Egyptian. So here we see that the word for mother in Middle Egyptian is given by the consonant MW.T. Remember that the ancient Egyptian, the Middle Egyptian language did not write out its vowels. And, and so in Coptic, it is pronounced Mawu. Remember that the W is a semi-consonant, it's not a vowel. So you wouldn't consider, you wouldn't really put U there, it's really a W, so it's Mawu. In Chiluba, we say Mawu, also Chimamu. But notice that in Chiluba, you have a consonant vowel, consonant vowel. Whereas in Coptic, you have consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant. Because it's supposed to be a W, not U. <coughs> we do the same thing here. For the word for daytime. Middle Egyptian, H R W it's dot W for Heru for day or time. In Coptic, it is Hu Hu -e. Notice consonant vowel vowel consonant. In Chiluba, this is uh this is consonant vowel vowel consonant, but it is is not what you think, and it is separated because it ends in the vowel. <coughs> And so this is a really a consonant vowel consonant because uh, you can write this uh, kuulu. This is really just to signify a long vowel, not really two two u's. You wouldn't say kuulu, it's kuulu. And so that's just how they um, use it. Uh, that's how they spell it on the online dictionary. And so here again we see here the word m capital s Middle Egyptian for walk and travel. In Coptic it is muse. Again, consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant. But this one ends in the vowel, but this is because of the influence of Middle Egyptian. <coughs> in Chiluba, it is samba, it's reversed. You know, so MS becomes SM. But, it, but there's also a variation of uh, capital SM in Middle Egyptian that fits with the Chiluba, which means to go, to walk, set out, pass. So, um, so this is, we would pronounce it samba again, consonant vowel, and this is a mb as one consonant, and then vowel again, consonant vowel, consonant vowel. It it is <laughs> same thing with the word for speech, you know, medu. See how the consonant vowel vowel consonant again. This e is 
based on a different uh, issue here. But because of this valve, these these two valves in the center, the same thing in um, uh, Chiluba, Malu, Balu, Madu, Mwanda, for uh, call, word, speech. And so from here, I go to explain the, the nature of the stress, vowels, you know, how this uh, happens, you know, and, and to show again and given the ex actual examples that he's given in Zande, Bere, Somali, Beher, Zande, Weary, Somali, Weil, Son, you know, Zande, Kpara, Cry, versus Somali, Kaili, Crying, you know, Vow, Y-A. You know, it's the same phenomenon. So how do we know that Wolof, you know, is a um, behaired branch? Because it has the same thing. They, the behair branch, their vowels, excuse me, their words don't end in vowels primarily. And so just like, in, you know, we see here in Wolof, all their words don't end in vowels. Versus the cognate word in a, in a behair branch, the Zande, Kira, for Kir, house, Baat, neck. Zande Goro <laughs> Beer. This is in this this isn't necessarily um um cognate, but you see the word it ends in the vowel. In 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 Wolof beer belly interior. In Tessin, Zande Vuru belly. Again, consonant vowel, consonant vowel. Here, consonant vowel, vowel, consonant. And so you know we can see these examples and we can see that Wolof is closer to Coptic given the nature of the examples, then um, Coptic is to Middle Egyptian. And it, it is because of examples like this that I've given, and I even went as far as demonstrating um, it in the, uh, how should I say, the collagen language. And so here's the collagen. This, again, is not in his book. The value of a book is able, if you can tell and show the rules and show that what you've been able to demonstrate in your work can be applied to other to other circumstances. And so we see the same thing here in collagen. Kut, house. Collagen, kut, a house. Middle Egyptian, minuit, serpentine goddess. Collagen, irenit, because uh, the M is a prefix which is lost, a serpent. Metanature, deity. You notice that nowhere in the collagen language does a word end in a vowel. You know, but in the Coptic it's the same way. Words don't end in vowels, primarily in Coptic. You know, and so when you see the, the vowels, that's a result of, you know, the contact with other languages. And so it is, it is as you can see here, Brother Nebetcher, you know, uh, begins his, you know, questioning. And we have over, you know, 100, you know, uh, um, posts or close to 100 posts, you know, uh, dealing with, this uh, particular question here. And he, uh, laugh out loud. You are posting others' work which you charge me with. I ask you to demonstrate that Chiluba is closer to the Middle Egyptian and Coptic. But thanks, I will check your sources out. Yada, yada, yada. And so we can tell here that he does not have a background in linguistics because everything that I've shown up here is a demonstration of why Coptic for it, I mean uh, middle uh, Chiluba, which is a Bantu language, is closer to Coptic than uh, excuse me, closer to Middle Egyptian than Coptic is. And so we see this explained here uh, in this particular chart. We see Coptic on the chart here given by Mboli, which is on a totally different branch of, of Negro Egyptian than um, Bantu is to Middle Egyptian. So we can see here that Bantu and Middle Egyptian derived from the same dialectical parent, whereas uh, Coptic and Shango and Somali and Zerma and Bandi and Nuer and Wolof, these languages on a totally separate branch, which do not share the same dialectical parent that these um, share. And so, because he didn't, he didn't understand it, and of course he didn't read the text. You know, we have this long, drawn-out argument that goes on for several different posts, you know, saying even uh, besides this, because he doesn't understand the nature of the argument, he doesn't understand linguistics and how, you know, saying this matters. And so I'm going to stop the share, you know, and um, you can unmute your mic, you know, to, um, 
you know, join in from here. <laughs> yeah, that that was good. So, yeah, that, that was good. I just wanted to say. Um, I just to say uh, well, no, go ahead, because I, I I wanted to go. I want to go over something that Jonathan did. Um, I mean, the only thing that I can say uh, at, at this point regarding that was that you know I think Brother and Bowley gave a real good analysis, a, a good, a real good analogy of what was happening in ancient Egypt. And I, I've I've spoke on this on on and matter of fact I uh, you know after you do your thing I will cite something that from that uh, supports Emboli that you know neither him in, neither Emboli or the author of this text you know know of each other and Emboli doesn't cite him which is saying the, the exact same thing so remember when Emboli uh, talked about how. Uh, you know what would happen you know because we always say that the ancient Egyptian culture you know saying comes from the south and that there was already certain people already in in the Nile Valley and so what happened is is that these middle Egyptian old kingdom um, speakers moved into and conquered the Egyptian I mean the, uh, the native Egyptians which we believe are the Coptic speakers, and they impose their language as the national language of the hieroglyphs, and so that's what you see here. And so the the Old Kingdom and Middle Egyptian, which we can demonstrate is a continuum, is the language of the conquerors who came out of Sudan and Uganda. But the Coptic language, which was the language of the dominant people, you know, didn't come into prominence. Until they lost their sovereignty, you know, when the middle Egypt, when the middle kingdom um, folks no longer ruled Egypt, and so now the writing script was being used to write the new kingdom script. Excuse me, the new kingdom language, which is a totally different language, you know, but it was using the exact same script, and which is why in every single, uh, you know book on the ancient Egyptian language, they talk about how drastically different the New Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom is, and that the New Kingdom really kind of throws off the so-called claim of continuity between Old Kingdom, Middle uh, Egyptian, and the New Kingdom going into uh, the so-called Coptic phase. Right. And so, um, you know, so this really explains you know what was going on and so we have the same thing happening in even in more modern times because back in the day the French as an example took over England and when the French took over England <laughs> the the dominant the prestige language was French and so all of the, the language of education was done in French, but the vast majority of the people still spoke English. It was called Anglais at the time. That's why in French when you say English, you say Anglais. That's what it's called. That's why you say Anglo-Saxon, you know, for the, for the English and British out. They spoke the Anglais language. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anglo. And when they won their uh, independence from France, the French language had already taken its toll on the English language, which is why the vast majority of, of words that we find in the so-called English language comes from French. And, uh, and, and if you can do any kind of comparison between French and, and, um, and, and English, and you swear that they were, you know, uh, came from the same direct, um, you know, parent. But they belong to two different branches. They're ultimately related with two totally separate branches. One being the, uh, the, the Latin branch uh, in terms of French, and then English being on the Germanic branch, which they have their own distinct nuances. But because of punctuated equilibrium and contact, a good number of French lexicon has made its way into the. Uh, English lexicon, 
And so we see the same thing happen in ancient Egypt to where the conquerors, the Middle Egyptian speakers, you know, dominated the area for a while and imposed their language in, in terms of the development of the script and things of this nature. And, um, and the, the Coptic speakers, who were the native speakers of the area, you know, was forced to write and communicate in that language. But once they, you know, got their in so-called independence, or they, uh, you know, they 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 adopted the the Greek script, you know, with a, a few demonic, you know, saying to write their own language, because the Greek, Greek script had vowels, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, so because you know we were being lazy in terms of the early researchers. They just automatically assumed that the ancient Egyptians, uh, the Middle Egyptian speakers, were the same as the Coptic speakers, and and this was due in part to the the whole Hermetic theory that the ancient Egyptians were really Semites who came into ancient Egypt, and so they considered they considered it one you know saying language uh, phylum excuse me one language con uh, continuum coming from Semitic all the way down into Coptic, which is why a lot of the research is Semeto-centric. And so, you know, uh, just wanted to add that there and, and to show that the linguistics helps to demonstrate why that is the case and 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 and, and um, why the cops didn't even, you know, saying um, adopt, you know, saying the old Middle Egyptian script, which is why when the Nubians so-called Nubians of Kushite kingdom took over in the 25th dynasty, they went back to their ancestors, you know, which was the uh, from the old kingdom and middle kingdom. What right. actually went from the old kingdom in terms of the, the art, the artistic style, the architecture, and um, the, the, the particular hieroglyphs that they used. This was all old kingdom stuff. And, and when, when, matter of fact, when you, um, when you read the Shabaka stone, the Shabaka stone, <laughs> uh, Shabaka is talking about, you know, uh, he's revitalizing the work of his ancestors. Right. You have to think in your head, if this is a totally foreign dynasty from the ancient Egyptians, why is Shabaka coming from the Kashinic kingdom talking about this is the work of his ancestors? And if it was the uh, if it was the work of his ancestors, which him being a Kushite, a so-called non-Egyptian speaker, why is he writing? Why is everyone in the 25th dynasty writing in the the uh, the Egyptian language? Right. Like people never ask that question. Like if I if I um, come and conquer you, I'm using my language. So why didn't they just use the ancient Egyptian script? To write their indigenous Cushitic language, right? Why did they, you know, just automatically was able to speak the the old kingdom and Middle East kingdom language and able to reproduce that just on a whim, mm -hmm. you know? And so, because the Middle and Old King was a totally different thing, the Cushites, the Cushites was reestablishing the 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 dynasty that were set up in the old and Middle Kingdom, right? <laughs> but you can go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that was good. I, I, I did uh, want to just add to add on to what you just said. Um, Binga supports that. Supports that. And um, let me see if I can find it. The fact that I'll just read. I was going to share, but my computer's taking a while. Um, mm -hmm. Binga says that two or more languages from the same geographical area give a lot of problems to the linguist because regularity can be due to contamination, dialect mixture, influence, borrowing of, tech, uh, of technical terms, etc. And then he gives an example. For example, Greek and Latin influence is shown in Oscan deities, few common nouns, and in some official titles. And then he says the borrowed words consist mainly of Greek words in Oscan introduced from the neighboring Greek colonies. So that, that seems to support a case for the um, Coptic, um, you know, because of the close proximity to the location, geographical location of the languages, 
you really can't tell, you, you really can't use that rigorous method to do a process of elimination because of the closeness in geographical terms of these languages. So that was one of the reasons why uh, Obinga, in that text I just uh, quoted, that he used Yoruba uh, against mm -hmm. uh, Middle Egyptian because it's in a completely different region and so on and so forth. So and that seems to support uh, some things that Mboli said in the interview as well. All right. But what I want, yeah, I want to go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, what I did, what I wanted to go over is um, the article that the brother Jonathan had written, and um, okay. but I want to put a disclaimer first, <laughs> because what what I know, what I know, know that will happen for sure is that mm -hmm. <laughs> people will watch this video. And say, hey, you know, brother Jonathan, brother uh, Neb Netcher, uh, Samotep and Wajau, man, they went in on y'all. You know, they they uh they went in on y'all. You know, and and did this and did that. So I just want to put out there that you know this is what we do. We um we we you know we just we talk we discuss things amongst each other all, all the time. Brother Jonathan is doing some amazing work. Um, I just recently saw a video of him on the Sarnetta TV show where he's addressing some Hebrew Israelite um, claims and counterclaims and debate um, issues. And he did a really, really, really good job because he really didn't have any material in front of him. So he's going right basically off, off of memory, um, off the dome. And he did a really excellent job. So anything that we talk about, you know, I don't want people to use this video to try to uh, instigate. You know, we got a lot of instigators out there. So uh, with that said, I just want to go into um, his article he wrote because he wrote it on his um, WordPress uh, website. And unfortunately, WordPress, you know, doesn't give a chance to show like a dialogue. So basically, his article is sitting up there and, and for all intents and purposes, it just looks unchallenged. So whatever he said in his article, if people read it, then they'll walk away with a certain impression. And when he first posted it, I had addressed the article, but obviously not on his website. I addressed it on Facebook. So if you go to his website, you don't see my my um, responses or anything. And it's just some key points I just want to go over. So I'm just going to share my responses real quick. Uh, let's see if I can. If this one will share properly. Give me a hot second. All right, where we at? Okay. Let me know when you can see it. I see it. Okay. Let me, let me uh, keep locking on yours. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, it's not lengthy. I don't want to get long-winded with it. I'm just going to pull out some key points. Um, and this kind of speaks to the earlier thing you said. Uh, you called it, you called it, I forgot what you called it, but... Um, when you read out of the book and you and it was one of the roadblocks you mentioned when people misquote um misquote data. Inaccurate observation. Right, inaccurate observation. Well yeah, inaccurate. Exactly. So this is a case of of, of that. So we start off, um, Brother Jonathan basically says, you know, he gives a shout out to the uh, Magi or the Magi. Vanguards of Kemet. I'm also a member of, of the Facebook group, you know. So again, disclaimer, brother, me and brother Jonathan um, talking and, and, and discuss and learn from each other all the time. So anyway. In other words, this is an in-house debate. Right. This is an in-house debate. Exactly. There's no nothing, uh, nothing with it. So for the naysayers that's going to try to use it, I beat you to it. All right. Um, <laughs> So this is the first one of the first things he said. Now I just I just kind of spot quoted him. So this is what he uh -huh. said. He says, um, a long discourse after which Osari Motep and Wujao Eri Ma'at eventually submitted and said Coptic is Egyptian. Now that's what he's saying. So this is a classic example of misquoting. Can you zoom in? Can you zoom in? Okay. Uh -huh. Let me zoom in. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Okay. I'll read it again. This is what one of the things he said. He says, A long discourse after which Asari Motep and Wajau Eri Ma'at eventually submitted and said Coptic is Egyptian. 
Now I, I, I stop there because this is an example of what I call you know a straw man argument and then miss uh, quoting or miss uh, which the what you said um, misquoting the data because nowhere in the, and I, I answer him I says this is false I never had any reason to submit to such a thing as I have never said Coptic was not Egyptian I can't emphasize more than I already have that we need to use specific terminology when engaging in these discussions. Coptic is a Negro Egyptian. Coptic is in the Negro Egyptian language family. Hence, it is Egyptian in that sense, and I have never said otherwise. Uh, then it goes on, and he says, in Theophilo Benga's book, an introduction to the linguistic historical African historical linguistics, page 67. Obenga notes that the comparison between Berber phonology and Egypt, Egyptian would be the decisive factor in establishing a relationship between the two languages. So, Wujao must have accidentally omitted Theophilo Benga when saying no one has done the reconstructive work with three dialectical parents, or maybe Wujao gives validity to Mboli's comparative method over Obenga. Although Obenga makes a phonological comparison between Berber and Egyptian. Lepriano also speaks about comparisons between Coptic and Egyptian, that the lexical structure and elements of the morpho syntactic are easily noticed by the non-specialists like myself. And so that's what he says. And I answered that very short and brief. I said, this is a fallacy of mischaracterization, mischaracterization of straw man. Again, Coptic is related, and I have never said it wasn't. I have always maintained that it is. And nowhere in the Facebook discussion that we had did anyone say that Coptic was not Egyptian. The argument became um, the, 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 the between Bantu and Middle and Middle Egyptian versus Coptic and Middle Egyptian. That's what it ended up being. So anyway, I think we need to, I think we need to uh, stress again um, that the <laughs> the convention is that there's five phases in the, the writing script. There's Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom, uh, Demotic, and Coptic. And <laughs> what Mboli argues is that, you know, and, and with that, what I just said, that there's a continuum, that from the Old Kingdom to Coptic it is one language and what we're witnessing is an evolution of the language. Right. And so with, with Mboli's work, he argues that that's not the case. And there's actually other authors who say basically the same thing. Now, including Dr. Ricchetti, which, you know, <laughs> which he likes to uh, throw in, into the discussion. But I, I can show that later. But the, um, so what Mboli does is he says, nope, given the evidence, Old Kingdom and Middle Kingdom are a continuum, but New Kingdom and Coptic are a different branch of the Negro Egyptian altogether. Right. They're, they're, a different, they're a different cultural and speech community that rose up, in which basically we will argue they got their independence coming in the New Kingdom. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, so with, he was confused. Because when I would say Negro Egyptian, he was thinking in his mind still Egyptian in terms of the singular continuum. Not understanding that, no, it's not an issue of Egyptian, it's an issue of Middle Egyptian and Old Kingdom as one language and New Kingdom Coptic as separate languages. Right. And so, you know, this is where a lot of the confusion. But again, they kept going off of this after this was explained, and even after we said read the text, which they refused to read the text. But I just wanted to, you know, put that in there so the the audience can get context for what we're saying. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Now, just to continue on, um, the brother Jonathan uh, goes on to say, in this work, Lepriano compares phonological systems, grammar verbal morphology, syntax, and many other linguistic elements of earlier Egyptian, Middle Egyptian, and Coptic. This is another great linguistic analysis between Egyptian and Coptic that some say has not occurred. 
So <laughs> you know, again, I, I responded. I said, I say again, this is a fallacy of mischaracterization, straw man. Again, I think it's related. I never said it wasn't. I'm, I'm getting some feedback from you, uh, Mike, a little bit. I say uh, I never said it wasn't. I have always maintained it that it is. Um, and what what he what what he did here? He quoted. We had a blog talk radio show, and he um, tried to quote me, but he misquoted me. So I, I basically reminded him that quoted me from a blog talk show that was unorganized, where people speak and talk on top of each other to the point where no one, where one cannot make a complete and intelligible point is disingenuous. As I explained on the blog talk show, I have Lepriano's work, Crumb's work, Allen's work, etc., and I'm aware of the comparisons they have done. So this could not, could not possibly be what I meant as it relates to what Emboli did. I made that clear on the show that the difference between Emboli and the others is that is the reconstruction of the proto language where the comparative methods can be employed to test it. And it was done so successfully starting with the languages, then, oh, st excuse me, starting with six, I, I admit it, starting with six languages and then an additional eight, making it 14 languages in all, as clearly explained in his book that no one has yet to examine, or no one has yet, has examined yet. Because, you know, we're dealing with, with um, people who, did not read in Bowley's work. And if they read it, they would be, I, I'm confident that if they read it, they would be in support of it because a lot of things that they're trying to argue, and Bowley is, is arguing it. It's just that they're not reading it and not understanding the, um, the science of it. And uh, let me go on. Hold on, before you go there, because I want to give context to the Briefly. The uh, the book that you're talking about is Lupriano's uh, 1995 work, Ancient Egyptian, A Linguistic Introduction. In this book, it is just a linguistic analysis of the ancient Egyptian, you know, uh, uh, languages. And in here you find reconstructions, but there is no analysis by Lupriano that he did any rigorous work to come to these reconstructions. These reconstructions he just made up for the for the book, and so and even in here he admits that the New Egyptian and Middle Egyptian poses problems right. you know, in terms of the, the, the continuation. But he was trying to use this book because I, I made the charge. In science, we, we were speaking of this earlier. In science, we do experiments to eliminate possibilities. Once you have eliminated all possibilities, the only thing that is left is more than likely the truth. Right. And so with that said, we, when it comes to Egyptian, we have at least two possibilities. One possibility is that, we, um, that the Egyptian language is a continuum and that Coptic is a last stage. And then we have another um, option, and that is Coptic is not uh, directly evolved from Middle Egyptian. That it is an indigenous language that is um, that that the the script now you know records at this particular time in history. Mm -hmm. And so, since we have those two possibilities, you have to do experimentation to eliminate one or the other. And the one that is left standing is the one that is the truth. And so when I challenge them, I'm like, who before Emboli did any kind of analysis that eliminated one of those possibilities? None. And so he tries to he tries to uh, give this book as if this is that analysis. And right. so with both of us having the book, we know for a fact that he does no such analysis. There is no linguistic analysis, no historical comparative linguistic analysis of the in this book. And also, all it is is go ahead. No, I was going to say even even when you read the book, uh, just just as a just when you read it, he he almost doesn't have he doesn't come away with the confidence even in his own reconstruction. Like you said, it seemed like it was done just to make certain points in the book, but not as a scientific uh, uh, advancement of the field. 
because it doesn't come off like this is confident and he, and that he's even confident because he's basically given a phonological outline of, of an introduction to the Egyptian language. You know, you know, that's what I got from it, even reading the book. You still there? My bad. My bad. I was on mute. But go ahead. Yeah. So that, no, that was it. That, that was it. I'm saying, um, as far as that, no, you you were going to continue on another point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This this is another point, and it's just a couple couple that I want to go over. Um, because I I want to I want to this is this is basically the same logical fallacy happening over and over again. You know, and and this is prominent in the conscious community. And you know, my thing is, if we can eliminate this, then I think we can get a lot more done in the conscious community. You know, actually, really be a conscious community by by diverting our attention elsewhere. So anyway, so Brother Jonathan goes on. To, there are many other authors' works on Coptic's relation to Middle Egyptian. Now I'm gonna stop right here for a second because you're, because his assumption is that that you know Asari Motep and myself. Are, we're saying that Coptic is not related to Egyptian or Middle Egyptian, so you can see that this is this is an ongoing thing. So he says there are many other works on Coptic's relation to the Middle Egyptian. The etym etymological dictionary of Egyptian by Gaber Ta Tax Tax or Takax offers an exhaustive exchange on Egyptian etymology concerning derivatives and etima. The Coptic etymological dictionary by Kearney or Cerny is very useful in knowing Coptic etymology, but it is also heralded above Walter Crumb's Coptic dictionary in regards to usefulness in knowing the former stage of the language. The prerequisite to forming an etymological dictionary mandates that the author has performed a comparative analysis in order in, to even render their works available. How else can you do etymological work but by matching meaning as well as the phonology of the chosen terms. So then I go on to, to um, address that and say again, the argument is not against Coptic being related. It is related. That much has always been clear. The point that is missed is the difference between the science employed by Mboli, unlike those who you keep mentioning. Mboli and Obinga's charts have been posted by me and Osar showing Coptic being related. I'm not sure why this is hard to get across other than for a straw man argument. The entire debate falls on the closeness of the relationship between Coptic and Middle Egyptian and the closeness of the relationship between Bantu and Middle Egyptian. That was the main debate question before the blog talk show. Crumb, Cerny, Budge, etc. do not speak to this debate question. Mboli does. Mboli does address these issues very thoroughly which is why he is the focus, but people have yet to examine his work. How a language can be genetically closer to another language, but not appear, which is topologically, as close as another language is a matter of linguistic understanding that I keep saying we all need to grasp and gain proficiency in. This is explained in, in, in Bowley's works and others. So there I stress that, you know, not being familiar with the field and not even reading the book, um, Things will appear to be something, but until you actually examine it and apply a rigorous method that Mboli did, you'll find out it's not. And it's, it goes into what you said, you, this process of elimination. A uh, major part of science is to eliminate. You know, you set up your experiments, you got your control, you got your, your experimentation, and then, you know, you do your testing and so on and so forth. Um, and, that, and that's the whole thing. One thing about the scientific method, uh, the falsifiability of something. You know, so it all ties in. And let me see. Um, was a couple more. I'm, let me pick another one that's not on the same same thing. Um, and, okay. and and just to reiterate, like there's a discussion that I recorded as well from Jonathan, and you know, like Jonathan says, yes, Coptic was born out of Demotic from late Egyptian which was born out of Middle Egyptian and old Egyptian. And so when when that's 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 what's kind of leading to that aspect of the discussion because he's still going off of this this thing and I keep reiterating to him that there's no proof whatsoever that Coptic is a direct descendant 
you know, and that's why I challenge them. Show me a work that did this analysis where they're able to demonstrate conclusively that Coptic comes from Middle Egyptian. There is no such text. Right. And and they, they have yet to be able to uh, to demonstrate this. And so, you know, um, you know, we didn't get on confirmation bias, you know, and all this other kind of stuff, but it's, you know, there's there's a rigor to this. And, um, and, and so you just can't... Um, you know, uh, like here's another uh, straw man. So I would like to know the time depth between Middle Egyptian and whichever Bantu language one qualifies as closer to that that you didn't copy. Right. Which is it shows he doesn't have a breadth of understanding of what we're talking about because any Bantu language would be closer to Middle Egyptian, given that it comes from um, the, the same, same branch. The same parent. Yep. Yeah, and so like you know, just as uh, and Boley said in our discussion on Sunday, that you know um, the innovation in Negro Egyptian comes from the Beher branch. Right, right. And you know, I uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say I I always um, you know I give a lot of analogies you know to try to get people to understand what I'm saying, and I remember on the blog talk show that I gave the analogy as a brother asked a question and I gave the analogy of how something can look like something else but something that doesn't look like it can be more closely related to it and I gave the example of, of just human biology human genetics and I, I said you, you can have two people and, and you can see this on certain websites where they'll show celebrities who are, mm -hmm. who are completely unrelated but they look alike they look like they're twins basically you know so I gave that example where you got people, cousins, distant cousins, whatever, will look like brother and sister more so than their actual brother and sister. You know, and I and I was saying that how you determine that now if we only went by looks, then we we we'll be making mistakes all day. I said so how you able to determine it scientifically is that you have to do DNA analysis on the the individuals involved. And I and I was saying that lingu comparative linguistics is is a analogous uh, process to that, where where you're you're dissecting the features of two languages to find out how closely related they are, uh, um, you know, between another language. So Coptic appears to to be close to Middle Egyptian because of the proximity of where the languages uh, lived than Bantu. Because like Bantu, like how you explain how the suffix, the uh, so-called feminine ending suffix is prefixed in Bant a lot of Bantu languages and these different features. So it looks different, but genetically it's closer. So, you know, that's the analogy that I gave on the blog talk show. And um, I didn't give it here, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, so just to, just to go on, uh, um, just one more or maybe two more. Um, Brother Jonathan goes on to say, that we must remember in the sense of linguistics, proto means it is unattested, hypothetical, and reconstructed to be what we believe is the parent language. It should be clear now that Wajao was in error in making claims about the lack of work done to show the relationship between Middle Egyptian and Coptic. So here again, here again he reiterates the, the straw man as if I said, Coptic and Middle Egyptian not related. So, so we, we scratch that out. Now we're dealing with the the word proto, and what it means in linguistics. So I say, pure straw man. It's common knowledge what a proto language is, but what's not common knowledge is the linguistic science used and how it is used and to what end. A proto reconstruction in historical comparative linguistics is a scientific theory based on a quantitative analysis used to explain the truths discovered in one's experiment, the comparative method. And that's basically what you said earlier. Uh, in other words, the theory, used in a scientific sense, not the layman's sense, is what is created after the successful experiments. This means that the theory is insignificant to the analysis. You can take away the theory and the facts will still remain. In the case of not, uh, Negro Egyptian, it is a scientific theory to explain the relationship between languages examined as demonstrated by the scientific method known as comparative, the comparative method in linguistics. The power and validity of the theory is its ability to be successfully applied to languages not examined by the initial analysis, but explains the forms 
that are witnessed that we witness in them. And Boley being meticulous provided just such an analysis. As stated in another thread, Mboli reconstructed the Negro Egyptian based on six languages, which is Middle Egyptian, Coptic, Zande, Hausa, Somali, and Sango. And this is the basis of his analysis and reconstructions. To test it, after he had already did the tentative reconstruction, he examined another eight languages in a different section of the book, which is the later part of the book, using the same inclusionary criteria for the Negro Egyptian setup earlier in the text. The addition and successful reconstruction of these languages, even go, going further and analyzing reconstructions of Proto-Bantu, is what validates Negro-Egyptian hypothesis. And the more languages we examine, the stronger the theory to explain these relationships exist. This was never done by anyone that the brother Jonathan had mentioned. And that's the point. That's, and that's what you just said, too. Like, show me one person who's done this before Mboli. So... That's the point I wanted to drive home, and I, I don't I don't really um, have to go through the rest because it's a continuation of the same straw man, but then it just shows the lack of knowing the uh, the science. Now I'm not, I'm not a linguist and I'm not an expert, but I've I know when to keep my mouth shut and and you know learn. I've learned enough. I gained enough proficiency to un at least understand what these people are saying, what the the scholars. The, the more experts in the field are actually saying so that I can have some more um, valid and intelligible questions to even ask, you know. So, um, I mean, that's pretty much it. And I, I just wanted to go over that because Jonathan's uh, WordPress article is being re-quoted and rehashed as if there was it was never addressed, um, even in the Amarat Squad uh, group. And it came up again in another blog talk. So hopefully... This video will kind of uh, lay it to rest or, you know, open the dialogue back up, kind of put the dialogue back in sync so we can really discuss um, and back the brother um, or, you know, in Boley's work. Matter of fact, uh, like I'm looking at uh, Brother Jonathan's article now, and it's, it's just sad what he, what he did in terms of quoting Dr. Winters who admitted that he didn't read the, he didn't read the book and then when he tried to google uh, google book search the book had as Dr. Winters always does is misquote you know the author and who he's looking at and so um for instance well, I have I have I have something right here um about that right in the um I mean, go ahead. I, I, I probably had the same quote. <laughs> well, it, it's several of them. I, I was just trying to show, like, like. Um, see, I have to find the actual where you know, because I'm I'm on his site, so of course he doesn't. Re he doesn't. Um, I'm I'm speaking of Jonathan here. He doesn't re uh, give my reply to Richard's misquotation. Um, and so he's 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 sitting here promoting. Uh, Dr. Winters as if Dr. Winters read the text and examined and did an analysis on Mboli's work. Well, and check so it out. There's the, go ahead. I, I had caught, I had, I had brought that I had brought that up. I actually quote, I got it on the screen now, um, okay. where I quote um, Dr. Winters actually saying, he admitted and I quote him, he says, I have not read Mboli's entire book, but I have read summaries of his book and then he gives the, the Google um, the Google books. Google books, you know, gives numerous, numerous segments of the bullies. So that's what he was relying on in all of these trials. Yeah. So I, which I, was, I, which was sad because again, you, uh, the, the the three intellectual uh, uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of intelligence that I talked about earlier, you know, in terms of being intellectually humble, being intellectually courageous. And have an intellectual integrity, and so you know, in this conversation with Dr. Winters here, you know, demonstrated that you know he didn't have intellectual uh, humility here, and he didn't have intellectual integrity because integrity would have been uh, where he where he actually examined the text and then gave an analysis. And, look, and so because he was in such a rush 
to uh, to uh, make a point, he totally misquotes, you know, the actual text. Exactly, and he even goes on. He even says, like I have it highlighted in blue. This is Dr. Winters speaking. He says, if you can read French, the pages at Google Books gives a good understanding of what Emboli is doing in his book. Now, how can, how, can you, how can you take 60 at the most, 60 pages of a 630-page technical linguistic manual, and you take 60 of those pages, and all of a sudden, you know everything that Emboli is doing? You know, exactly. and for him to be a scholar, because uh, Winters, you know, Winters has uh, some scholarship out there, some scholarship out there. Um, but for him to be, for him to be that, and then, uh, you know, to me, this is kind of reckless. This is like reckless uh, scholarship, and this is what we have to be careful of. Because there's there's people such as uh, Neb Netter who look up to Winters, and other people look up to Winters. So when Winters do, do things, when they, people like him do things like this. It distort, it distorts the uh, the whole community. Matter of fact, there's there's uh, there's something for that, you know, because I want to I want everyone to know that there's terms for what a lot of what we're talking about here, and and the one that they're guilty of here is selective observation. This is one of those robots to um, to truthful reasoning, and so in the selective observation. You know, it says, in many cases, selective observation occurs when, in the research process, people acknowledge only things that are consistent with their preconceptions. When researchers approach situations and, uh, situations and observe facts selectively, they are more likely to engage in poor thinking and subsequently reach false conclusions, even without doing so consciously. And so, again, this is, this is what we have here, a bit of selective... Uh, observation and so the only reason why uh, Jonathan and Netcher you know even pulled up this because it appears to be agreeing with what they're agreeing with but because they have not examined because none of none not at this particular at that particular point none of the three people we're mentioning Dr. Clyde Winters Jonathan or Netcher has read the book and so for you know, for Clyde Winters to go in on a text that he may have addressed something critical two chapters ago, and try to select something minute for it, and then try to make a, a, a big critique out of it without even understanding the nature of the text, because just as you said earlier, this text is different. He's starting from scratch from the beginning and showing you all the way down to the end of the text, you know how he came to his conclusion. And so at the end, and and so there are certain aspects at the beginning of his text that he no he doesn't adhere to at the at the end of his text because further analysis which he demonstrates, um, you know, throws that idea out the window, right? Or forces him right. to abandon you know saying that particular thing. So he's showing you if you read the the subtitle is is showing you. You know the the steps and methods of the comparative method. It's a teaching book. It's teaching you how to do the the historical comparative linguistics. So for someone to try to come at the end of the text and try to cite something, or even in the middle of the text and cite something without context, you know, it's just totally disingenuous, and the, the intellectual uh, integrity is just not there. And so this is what we what we see here with this selective. You know, saying reasoning uh, in terms of this particular aspect of the logical fallacy. Exactly. You know, uh, selective observations. And he, he you know, he also um, he also misrepresented Emboli's work by going into the Indo-European. How he said that Emboli is using Indo-European uh, constructs or whatever. You know, and that and that was like completely. I mean, I mean. I mean you could guess. You couldn't even guess and look at the table of contents. Right. Like, like what? Like, uh, matter of fact, let me find this um, this aspect of our discussion because, like, you know, I just, I just couldn't believe that somebody with a with a PhD and, I'm, and I, you know, I'm, I might have to question that, you know, uh, 
could just totally misrepresent. Like I'm telling you, he 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 has this habit of misrepresenting works. Uh, I don't know what I'm saying. You know, but you know, so it's, just, I'm, I'm on pay. It's, it's it's one thing to misrepresent somebody's argument, but it's another thing to to argue what the other person is arguing. Like if I say apples are red, and then you misrepresent my argument, and then you yourself are saying apples are red, I'm like, what's the point? You know, that's, that's what it seems like he, he did on some of the on, on the Egyptian search form. You know. Yeah. So see, here's here's this section where. Um, hold on one sec. I'm going to share, and you know we have to wrap up soon. Um, yeah, we like three hours, three hours in. There. Nobody gonna watch this whole video. No, nobody's gonna see the disclaimer. People are just gonna watch the first hour and then call uh, uh, Neb and Jonathan. Yo, they turning on you, uh, man. I think y'all need to get on Sonetta TV and debate, man. Let's pay some money, boy. Go in the ring, tough it out. You know, I can see it. I'm saying this before it happened. Call me Prophet. With Jao the Prophet. And what do you know? I am the only one left here. We still broadcasting? All right, for everybody who's watching, I'm the only one here, and I didn't start the the um, live stream, so I can't disconnect. Oh, there you go. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. You know. Left me out uh, there in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, you go through these hiccups. You know. The, Technology, um, and so let me put that there. Is that everyone? Okay. So, um, so you know, the, um, 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 can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. So this is no, this is a casuals page. Um, okay. Here's Dr. Winters trying to quote. Uh, Mboli. And so he's talking about Mboli presents a number of proto Negro Egyptian terms in his book and proto terms generally. When describing a proto term, you add a asterisk to indicate that it represents the proto form of a word. Mboli, excuse me, Mboli wants the proto Negro Egyptian to agree with proto Indo European terms. As a result, in Mboli's reconstructions of proto terms, he usually adds HW to his reconstructions, just like they uh, are found in proto Egyptian. Uh, which, if you just read the dang book, you know, this, this, it was, there, he does no such thing. It's just ridiculous. Right. And, and so, in, in this, he tries to quote Mboli, you know, on this, on this term on cattle, so to speak. And so you can see here him bringing his argument on one. You know, word for cattle, in uh, trying to show this is, but this is what's important here. So here's the Proto Negro Egyptian terms in Boli. So he makes this 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 chart. So in here he has Proto Indo European on the right, you know, and then this uh, allegedly Proto Negro Egyptian here on the left. So you see this form here, this word H uh, sub sub two G H N O lamb, yep, and all of that kind of stuff. Yep. <laughs> That's not even a proto Negro Egyptian reconstruction. Anybody who knows anything about proto Indo European reconstruction knows about the three different H's. So when they're reconstructions, because they're they're trying to uh, argue for this laryngeal theory, which I won't get into now. But he has this H two O G H N O here thing here, which is a uh, a mistake, 
And so, you know, so he goes on, he try, he makes his, uh, this whole elaborate argument and, and uh, misconstructing. So here I come, you know, basically saying this is a piss poor attempt at discrediting his work. As stated earlier, after all of his analysis, the last section of the entire book examines possible correspondences with Sumerian and Proto-Indo-European. He is not basing his analysis on Indo-European. You can continue to say this, in, uh, you can continue to say what you say in your head, but it still won't make it true. That's what people who don't read the book don't understand. Secondly, there are tons of words for uh, in Egyptian for cattle, and so I give all of this here. And so here I'm quoting Mboli directly, you know, uh, in the French, and then I give my English translation, you know, of, of what it's talking about here. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, from page 591, you know, 87. So you notice Winters doesn't give in his thing any page number for you to go to uh, or anything like that. And so, uh, you know, as I stay I here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I say, as I stayed here, as we can see above, in the section dealing with the possible correspondences between Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Negro-Egyptian, Mboli clearly does not consider the word H2GHWNO, proto Proto Negro Indo, uh, Proto Negro Egyptian, but of Proto Indo European. In other words, he never claimed that this was a Proto Negro Egyptian reconstruction, but Proto Indo European. And Boley, in his own words, makes this clear uh, that this is a Proto Indo European word. After his statement, then comes the footnote, page 87, uh, page 591, uh, footnote 87. But the statement before the notification 87 states this you know, yada, yada, yada. So I say, by what stretch of the imagination could you have possibly gotten this wrong if you read directly from the page? Seriously, how? And so, you know, um, so this is the text here. So after this discussion, after I read it and proved that he didn't misread, that he didn't did that logical fallacy of um, inaccurate observations <laughs> on this text, so here comes Brother Casual, not being diligent, you know, just quoting in uh, Dr. Winters and Ho in hopes that this would be some kind of rebuttal. So you see the same image. This is from his page, rapgod.wordpress.com, right. with the extension of the link, where he's he's using the misquotations and misanalysis of of Dr. Winters to try to argue or rebuttal against me and um, Brother Amboli on this work. And this is what I mean by we can't have this kind of piss poor scholarship uh, on because he has this on the web. He hasn't taken this down yet, you know. And so, you know, anybody who's looking for answers or whatnot is going to come across this on the web and not understand how piss poor of a response this is and how this is based on conjecture and not reading the text. And so this is why we spent all of this time, you know, in the beginning of our talk uh discussing the the methodology of rigor and all of this in order to make arguments and why we're citing from these these texts on research methodologies you know on on such things as selective observations straw man inaccurate observations um you know the reliance on authority so they thought that they was going to find uh Dr. Winters they was going to find them an authority and use his name to try to uh, bring their points across, you know, in in a manner to, to to bring more validity to their to their point, which it backfired because they 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 quoted a misquote and then built their whole argument off of a non-argument, you know, which uh, in Boli neither I uh, nor you made in any of our discussions, you know, concerning the. Uh, the nature of the Negro Egyptian language file. And so yeah. this is the kind of stuff that we're trying to prevent. And so if we're going to have meaningful dialogues, we're going to have meaningful discussions, it got to be based on truth. There has to be integrity in the nature of what we're talking about. So once we establish what is what is what people are actually saying, then we can have, you know, uh, some disagreements, you know, based upon the, the actual evidence, not something that somebody made up in their head and decided that they're going to argue from the, the, the made-up fictional fantasy 
than what is actually being discussed, you know, in the particular dialogue. Yeah, that's yeah, and by you saying that, that, that pretty much kind of sums up um, everything. The uh, only thing I would add is that in uh, in the community in the community, um, there there's a there's you know you got people who will come up with an opinion, mm -hmm. and, and when you you know to have discussion with them scientifically, they get kind of offended, and you know we kind we kind of uh, I guess it speaks to the humility aspect yeah. that you were talking about earlier. Because you, you really can't have an opinion about something unless you are proficient or qualified to do so. Like, I mean, I mean technically, everybody can have an opinion. But yeah. the opinion is valueless if you don't, if you don't have proficiency in what it, whatever it is you're talking about. And, and what comes to my mind is that, like, for example, I heard uh, one of the brothers, I forgot who, who said this, but one, somebody said that um, I agree with Dr. Obinga. Obinga's um, challenge of the Afroasiatic uh, language phylum or the Semitic uh, language phylum because, and then they give a because, and the because is that, you know, Semitic is named after Shem, and Shem is not real. <laughs> Shem, Shem is yeah. a biblical character, and his fiction is not real, so how can you have a language named after a fictional character, not knowing that that is completely irrelevant. You can name something whatever, <laughs> whatever. You could call it the, the Santa Claus language phylum, the Miley Cyrus uh, language. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. That doesn't matter. So, so I'm saying that to say people don't even have an idea of what it takes. You know what what the actual arguments are, what the actual uh, claims are, and they're just coming up and making up stuff and then having these dialogues. So we kind of got to be careful of that. Um, exactly. you know, That's what I'm like. You got to make the. You gotta, you gotta do diligence. You gotta do the, you gotta do the knowledge. It takes years, and so remember that this is we. I made that post in August, the end of August. You might as well say September. Mm. Uh, so the beginning of September, end of August, and so it is November now, but you know, so within a couple of months, you know, they claiming that they have enough knowledge on the subject that they had no knowledge of prior to you know to to falsify you know this data something that it took this man 10 years to write right and they're relying on someone because they may have tenure in doing some similar things they're relying on someone else who hasn't even read the work either you know in Boley's work you know that this is what I said on a post somewhere yesterday um, this work uh, by Mboli is ha is going to have the same impact as as uh, as a Sheikh Anta Giab in 1974. You know, it's going to have that explosive um, shakeup of 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 what people think. You know, what what people have accepted because it, it's in all of the grammars. It's in all of the the beginners Egyptian uh, when you try to learn it, the the meta or the hieroglyphs. Everyone repeats the same thing. You know, the language the language of Egypt. Is broken into five phases, and they go to Old Egyptian, Middle Egyptian, Late Egyptian, Demotic, and Coptic, and they do it with the with the spoken language, and then they break it up with the scripts, you know. And by the way, this is a shameless uh, plug, though I am working on a book, <laughs> a um, a uh, beginner's uh, book, but but my what I'm going to do, or what I'm doing, is uh, I'm going to utilize the data that Mboli has presented and and the African school uh, in general and coming from that lens outward and and basically give an introduction or beginners uh, study course to learning the hieroglyphic hieroglyphs or um, what I call a seshmedu nachir so um, you know for everybody listening be on the lookout for that uh, so I'm, I'm going to include a lot of things that we've been talking about um, because it's reshaping, and it makes sense. It's reshaping, and it's answering some questions that that uh, other Egyptologists or um, authors of of that type of stuff they didn't answer, or they left they left open, you know. Um, so anyway, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to uh, just read this. Uh, I wrote uh, an article, you know, called "Egypt in Its African Context: Note Three Towards a Method for Vocalizing Metanetra Symbols." This is why I first premiered that the transliterated uh, lowercase a, 
you know, was a K at times past. And so uh, in, on, on page three, I start talking about uh, Helmut Thatzinger, who's a uh, linguist and Egyptologist who wrote a book called The Egyptian Connection, Egyptian and the Semitic Languages. So, you know, he's very Semitocentric. And <laughs> let me just go here. Can you see the page? Uh, one second. Yeah. Yep. You know, I write in here, you know, Helmut Satzinger, his book, which I mentioned earlier, although trying to make the case for a strong Semitic and Egyptian connection, provides these comments that reaffirm much of what we're saying here. One, that Egyptian has much in common with Semitic as compared with most Cushitic, including Omotic and Chadic languages, but when evaluating similarities between individual branches of Afroasiatic, it is crucial to take into account the factor of time the historical factor and the possible aerial effect. So he talks about the factor of time. For instance, Egyptian and Akkadian were attested in the third millennium BC, other Semitic languages somewhat later. The other branches of Afroasiatic are attested only recently, with the exception of the rather meager evidence of ancient Libyan, and other and often enough not enough not to a satisfactory extent. This means that comparisons must allow for a further development of several thousand years on the side of the other branches. The historical cultural factor. The Afroasiatic relationship dates back to Mesolithic times. Many important cultural achievements such as agriculture and cattle breeding are later. The social structure and the form of the rule have changed drastically. This is of particular importance for the lexical comparison. Many terms that appear basic to us cannot be expected to be part of the inherited common vocabulary. <clears throat> and then he goes on there. So we get into the more important part. Aerial effects. The prehistory of the speakers of the individual branches of Afroasiatic is controversial, as is the question of the origin of the original Afroasiatic homeland. And consequently, the reconstruction of the migrations from their past uh, from their present locations. It is usually very hard to say who in the course of time used to be neighbors of the individual groups. Historical Egypt is constituted of two populations, that of the Delta and that of the Nile Valley. Most probably these groups had different languages and it is only one of them that is the ancestor of historical Egyptian. And at present, many assume that Proto-Egyptian is the language of the Southerners. We know nothing at all about the other language. The valley population is not indigenous. It is immigrated. It has immigrated either from the south or from the southwest. The implications of this question concern the languages which, with which the ancient Egyptians may have had contact before it entered the light of history. In the south, we may expect Cushitic languages apart from Afroasiatic, various Eastern Sudanic languages, and Cordofanian languages. In the Southwest, the, presuming, the presumable neighbors would probably have spoken either Chadic languages or Saharan languages. But these assumptions are, of course, based on the present distribution. <laughs> so, with that being said, um, catch what I was saying? Yeah, or yeah. Or what I read? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so, with with that being the case, what did, what did he just say? That there were two populations in the in Egypt, one in the Delta, and then you know the uh, the the what we would call Upper Egyptian population. The Upper Egyptian population, uh, or from the south, is what came and took over the North, mm -hmm. which uh, excuse me the, and, and I'm speaking now in terms of our orientation. So our North. And um, in in our south, which was reversed in ancient times, but in the delta to the north was the people who came from the south, you know, who imposed their their political system, culture, and language on them. And so he admits here that there was two languages spoken, but they don't know who the second language was. And so what with in Boley's work, remember that was written in 2003, 2010 okay. come in Boley's work, you know allows us to, you know, more precisely speculate that it was the Coptic that was in that area. Right. Under and those are the people that were, um, that, that were, um, 
who who were taken over, so to speak. And so, oh, let me read this one thing, and, and I'll end with this. Let me go back. Let me share the screen. And so, in the same text, I'm gonna read Dr. Ricchetti. <laughs> So, you know, when talking about the different stages in her essay, The Unity of African Languages, in, in uh, Karanga and Carruthers, 1986, Dr. Ricchetti says, in terms of the different the, the designations, these designations, however, reflect not so much stages in the development of the Egyptian language, per se, as rather stages in an evolving political history of the various dynasties. What Gardiner called Late Egyptian was the dialect of Upper Kemet, traces of which were already noticed in the Old Kingdom, in Upper Kemetic sites, in dynasties 6 through 11. The vernacular called Middle Egyptian was predominant in Kemet. During the first intermediate period, this dialect spread northward. By the late 11th dynasty and early 12th dynasties, so-called Late Egyptian forms occur on on all types of monumental inscriptions. When the Nubian regime regained power in the 18th dynasty, the vernacular of Upper Kemet spread with the establishment of the New Kingdom. Amenhotep II composed a letter to his viceroy in Nubia, and it was used, and, and in it he used what has come to be called Late Egyptian. In other words, his language was that of Nubia or Upper Egypt. And so there's different, what she's giving here is evidence for different languages. And even during the time of the old kingdom, the new kingdom language, there was evidence of the new kingdom language already in the uh, Egyptian records. So if it was a continuum, if late Egyptian or new kingdom script was a continuum from uh, uh, middle Egyptian, which was a continuum of old Egyptian, how are we detecting new kingdom uh, uh, Egyptian in the old kingdom before the middle kingdom, which gave rise to the new kingdom? Exactly, and so this this is why I you know it's funny when um, Netcher tries to cite Riketi Amin when her, her works contradict everything that he's trying to argue. Mm -hmm. And so you know when when I agree with certain things, I don't agree just because somebody said something. I'm looking for evidence everywhere and to see what the evidence supports in this thing. And so. This is even some of the new stuff that I, you know, I've even sent to Mboli that strengthens his argument. And so when Mboli does this, it's just another, you know, layer of evidence that that says what everybody else is saying that Egypt composed of different languages. And so you might have some Coptic in the Middle Egyptian because the Coptic speakers, you know, uh, utilize some of their terminology writing the ancient Egyptian script. But Middle Egyptian, Old Kingdom Egyptian, is a totally separate language. And that's um, and like and like I said in in uh, the beginner's book that I'm uh, going to be providing, I'm I'm trying to set the stage for for a um, you know I guess a consensus in nomenclature about about all of this. And I kind of posted up in the Meta Nature Facebook group where you have um, what some people say Ur and Kemet. Which will be from the mouth of, of Kemet, which will, is like us saying the national spoken language of Kemet. That is just saying the national spoken language of the polity or of the pop of the of the nation. You know, the national official language. That's basically what that phrase is saying. But, but within that, the language itself can change. Uh, not not that it's a continuum or or change like that. Not an evolution thing. But it's just the selection of the dominant, uh, either dialect or the language. So, for example, the um, Middle Egyptian, what they're calling Middle Egyptian, becomes Ur in Kemet or Ra in Kemet for a certain period. Then, the Late in Egyptian, what they're calling Late Egyptian, becomes dominant, and that too becomes the Ra in Kemet for a different period. So, when when we explain it like that, everything starts falling in place and making sense with the data. That's coming forth from um, what you just quoted and coming forth from Mboli. So, so if we start speaking like that and using these terms, then we're not going to be thrown off when, when you know, we start discussing the, the actual specific linguistic uh, information. Again, quote to quote Dr. Ricchetti, 
These designations, however, reflect not so much stages in the development of Egyptian language, per se, as rather stages in the evolving political history of various dynasties. Yes. Yeah. So you have, you yeah. know, ultimately related people, different dynasties, who their indigenous or mother tongue may have been different, and they're all utilizing the same script to communicate. Right. And because they're in such close proximity, you know, it, it because the, the early linguists weren't doing their due diligence, and we didn't really have enough time to really talk about the faults of the uh, Africana school, but maybe we can reserve that for a different discussion. But, you know, um, and maybe we'll have Emboli on for that one, you know, uh, in terms of the, the Africana school. And, and so we, we have these circular debates, you know, on, on issues that, that people are trying to argue that nobody did the research on. You know, they just made an assumption and, just, and somebody rolled with it. And then enough people rolled with it that it just became convention. But there was no, there's no study that you can cite, you know, where this this particular possibility was eliminated. And so, you know, uh, you know, we can go on and on, but you know, we this what three and a half or four hours. <laughs> yeah, three and a half hours. But you know, I want I want to say this that inside inside everybody that we mentioned, any any anybody that wants to come and try to challenge this at this point, um, it's there's it's embedded that people know know this because I always ask the question if if what everybody else is saying is true then then why why is anyone going through the trouble of reviving anything why don't we all just fold up our books and everything and just study Coptic just exactly. just study Coptic learn Coptic speak Coptic and call it a day Wouldn't, wouldn't that be much so much easier there, there wouldn't be any books out exactly. there just, let's just learn Coptic and matter of fact, again, you know, we kind of hinted on this beginning, but, you know, there would be no reason for the African school. You know, let the Europeans, they got it all right from the beginning. There's just no reason for Africans themselves who live in the area, who, who speak the, the related languages, who, who, who still uh, practice the same culture in terms of kingship, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, ritual rites, religion, and they have the same deities. These people just, it's, there's no reason for them to even get into the game. Right. You know, because the, 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 the European has just set everything straight. And so, you know, and, and they, what, what, basically what they're arguing is for the European school, you know, of, uh, of Egyptology and, and trying to say that the African school is, is incorrect, you know, without engaging the African school's text. And every one of these people are more than qualified. You know, matter of fact, uh, Mubabingi Bilolo, when he sent an open letter to a conference that didn't accept his paper, uh, um, you know, it, it, Bilolo had to show off for a moment because, you know, uh, everybody who was ex whose papers were accepted, it was kind of on the same old, same old, you know. And what he was, what he wanted to, to demonstrate at this international Egyptology conference that they hold only so many years in Europe, that everybody that was on the panel was white and from two countries. Wow. You know, uh, France and uh, England. Mm. And maybe somebody from Germany or something like this. And so he said, how is this an international forum <laughs> and there's nobody from around the world, you don't even have women you know, uh, engaged in this conversation. And, and, and he's like, how are y'all who, who took, you know, 30 hours, you know, on a, on a particular course path more qualified than anybody in the African school? How many of y'all are more qualified than Obinga, you know, on this subject? A man who speaks 12 languages, who reads Arabic, Greek, Marian, ancient Egyptian, speaks Bantu languages, you know, even knows Wolof, knows the Latin and, and, and things of this nature. You know, who's who which one of y'all have his qualifications, you know, in philosophy and, and in terms of the uh, the hieroglyphs and things of this nature? None of y'all. And then he starts going into he's talking about who which which one of y'all is more qualified than Omen Digi, the Oscar Pafune. Then Uba Abu Bakri Musalam. Which one of y'all on this panel 
is more qualified than me. Somebody who has degrees, you know, in Egyptology, in philosophy, uh, who speaks 10 languages, you know, um, who, who knows, the, you know, saying the Greek, the, the Arabic and things of this nature. He's going off on himself. Which one of y'all are more qualified than me to reject, you know, um, you know, my paper, you know, saying my abstract because you feel that it is not, um, uh, it's not, you know, saying new. He's like, who in the European world is doing comparisons between ancient Egyptian and Bantu for right. this not to be new? You know, because, you know, with a, with a conference, you're supposed to be getting new and compelling research. And so all of the, the research that was done at this particular conference, you know, was the same old, same old stuff. It was nothing new there, you know. But because of the, 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 the inherent racism in the field, you know, when, when Bilolo submitted this, you know, they, they, tried to, they, they tried to dismiss it as if, you know, like this wasn't engaging, like it's not life challenge, like, like it's not, um, it's not in, how should I say? Uh, it matter. <laughs> it, it's not that it's not it matter, it's not that it's not, it, that, like this isn't something that's not going to overturn the field. Because if you've been in arguing that you know is is related to Semitic, you know we know why they didn't you know why they didn't do it you know because Bilolo's one of the people in the camp that's been at these conferences and dispelling the myth that you know ancient Egyptians had anything to do with Arabs, Semites, and Indo-Europeans. And so when he comes with this analysis where he's going to be able to demonstrate the Bantu character, you know, of the the ancient Egyptian language and culture, you know. Uh, one of the things he had to do is flex. He, you know, he's talking about on government. You know, he's talking about which one of y'all have actually witnessed the uh, the instalment of a king. You know, I am a prince in my own tradition. <laughs> you know, the same things that we see in in the Congo, we see in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it's stuff like this, and why the, the there's there's validity in the African school because these people live the culture. You know, when you're talking about the south of Egypt, who lives to the south of Egypt? Everywhere where these scholars are coming from. And so Mboli comes from, you know, the cultures that come from the south, which gave rise to Egypt. You know, Bilolo comes from that school. Um, Sambu comes from that school. I mean, from the, from that location. Um, uh, Theophilo Obinga comes from that location. You know, who are you to tell the people you know who gave whose whose heritage, language, and culture gave rise to Egypt. That you know they don't have a say, like they won't have any insight into you know the nature of uh, the ancient Egyptian culture, you know, language, religion, you know, and, uh, and and political system and things of that nature. So you know this is why we have to be uh, diligent and you know at, at least read our scholars' works to show. To, to be able to see what the great difference is between the European and the African schools and why, you know, we roll with the African schools. It's not just because they're African. It's because when you actually examine their work, Egypt starts to make sense. When you read your Indo-European work on Egypt, stuff don't make sense. You know, it's, it's taken out of cultural context because they're trying to look at it through the lens of Semitic speakers. Yeah. But when we start looking in that uh, in, in Egypt in terms of its African context, then everything starts to make sense. Now we can start getting to the truths about it. And as we spoke of earlier in terms of speaking to prosperity, now if we want to reconstruct in terms of the culture, in terms of the language, in terms of the processes of ancient Egypt in modern times, we have something more, more factual to base that off of and not something that is just, you know, hearsay and guesstimations, you know, uh, in, in terms of, you know, these people who are totally culturally uh, distant, you know, from the ancient Egyptians and even the modern Africans, um, you know, and, and the kinds of um, hypotheses that they impose, you know, on ancient Egyptian culture. And so, you know, with that, unless you have a last word. <laughs> Nope. You know, I'll, I'll, my last words ends up, end up 
sparking up another conversation. So that's <laughs> You know, that's it. but yeah, I man, I appreciate. No, that's good. That's good. Um, I appreciate uh, you 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 doing this, and um, and then the Emboli interview that was very very good. So that's it. We just gotta keep, we gotta keep going, and hopefully, you know, if this is watched by anyone, um, uh -huh. I'm on Facebook. Wujao Eddie uh, Maat on Facebook. Wujao at uh, Yahoo.com. Anybody uh, wants to join in the discussion or have anything to share or anything to ask about anything or just uh, join the Meta Nature um, language uh, group, the Amara Squad Scholarship group, and there's a couple other groups that I, I'm in where, you know, this kind of information is talked about, brought up, and we can just keep it moving, just keep discussing, learn, and share. That's it. So that's all I wanted to say. Right, hit me up. All right. What he said. Uh, I'll make sure that I put in the description, you know, the the those connecting point, I mean, those connecting uh, addresses, and um, you know, we'll move on from there. But I ain't gonna say nothing else. Just I uh, appreciate everybody who hung with us this long, uh, and for those who are come back and you know, probably take several days to go through this because you're so busy. Uh, we appreciate you all, and uh, we're gonna continue the discussion because I know we're gonna be uh, continuing and debating this, you know, forever. But um, yep. but yeah. So man, I, I appreciate everything, and um, uh, good night to everyone else. All right, All right. peace. Hold that. Hold that. Hold that. Peace.